Welcome to a live stream of Mysterious Alice Ghost Investigation with John Rasmus, also known as John Houston. Uh, some people might be curious as to why I go by John Rasmus, you know. Uh, Google Hangouts was disabled, so I don't know if we can invite someone. I'll give it a shot. We will see what happens. I don't know. I don't think I can invite Brandon Young, but Brandon wanted to be here tonight. I'm going to try my best, and to be honest, I didn't have time to research. There's a way to do it, but you have to use an encoder. And I have downloaded an encoder, and I tried to use it on Twitch. It's pretty complicated. But uh, John Rasmus, also known as John Houston here, and uh, just for anyone curious, John Houston is John Rasmus. John Rasmus is John Houston. Same person. Uh, it's not a persona that I invented. For example, there are many YouTubers that use a different last name, like Jenna Marbles. Jenna Marbles said she put Marbles as her last name because as she was starting as a YouTuber, getting a little success, but she planned it from the beginning. If anyone searched her, they didn't. She didn't want people to bother her parents, and it had nothing to do with uh, anything other than to protect her family's privacy, and that was my intent as well. But eh, doesn't matter. Uh, see, when I ghost investigate, I was actually interviewed by the Travel Channel, and they were confused as to the John Houston John Rasmus thing. If you're confused as to YouTubers using a different last name, then you're not familiar with how YouTube works. There are millions of YouTubers that use a YouTube name. It's standard procedure. Uh, but there are actors that have a persona, like Dylan the Hacker, rest in peace. Dylan supposedly passed away. Very sad. But Dylan the Hacker was a persona he created. He created a different persona, too. I can't remember the name of the other one, but he was a very talented comedian, member of the meme crew. Uh, there's only five meme crew members. There's three Pac, rest in peace. Dylan the Hacker, rest in peace. And three Pac and Dylan the Hacker are two personas those two individuals created. Three Pac's name was... Uh, I believe Ryan, and uh, he created 3Pac. And sure, his friends started to see 3Pac became him and he became 3Pac, but really they were two distinct things. But uh, anyway, the other meme crew members, BG Cumby, he trolled two major news stations and then had a brick thrown through his window and had his channel suspended. Uh, just the meme crew have had a lot of bad luck. And then there's two female meme crew members, Schmitty, and then the other one need not be mentioned. Okay, Papinia. But who cares? So Brandon Young, if you've seen his reaction to the Grist Mill investigation, I'm glad I posted that because he was going to talk at greater length during this live stream. Let me see if I can invite someone. I don't think I can. This is a, wait a second. Wait a second here. Wait a second. No, I'm just looking at the viewers. And thanks, uh, Caesar Rabbit, for joining us. Let me share this link so people can actually see what's going on. I don't know how to share this link because this is brand new. This is brand new. I've never done a live stream with this particular feature because Google Hangouts has been disabled. Uh, I wish I uh, could really show. I, I can I can get the stream link. I literally have to go to youtube.com slash hoax hunter. Wow. It's a very limiting feature here we have. But I'm still going to do a live stream. I'm going to do a book review. I'm going to do a book review of a book I just finished reading entitled The Enigma of the Poltergeist.
But let's share this live stream link out. It looks like a lot of people are sleeping or a lot of people are East Coasters or whatever the case. But I'm a West Coaster, so I'm still wide awake. Um, the night has just begun for me. And I'm a night owl and I stay up all night because that's what night owls do, especially on the weekends. Um, Live streaming now. Gonna have to let Brandon know that uh, I can't add him as uh, someone to join in because Google Hangouts were supposed to be disabled in October. They're not supposed to be disabled right now. I guess YouTube jumped the gun and... Uh, just messaging Brandon, letting him know I can't invite him even if I wanted to. It's unfortunate. Google Hangouts has been disabled. I can't see any invite feature. I don't see it. I know I should have researched this, but I research using hands-on firsthand, you know what I mean? Um, man. All right. Well, I wanted to give a shout-out to Gary Galka. Not that he needs a shout-out. He's the uh, extreme ghost meter expert who has a company called Pro Measure. He's been selling and making professional meters that professionally detect different things for companies, factories, individuals. And he decided to create a ghost hunting meter, the most professional one ever made called the Mel meter. And my antenna broke off due to wear and tear, just normal use. I use this all the time. And so this antenna, I have to very carefully open it because on one of the episodes where you saw me investigate the haunted parking lot, I pulled it out real quick and it broke. It broke due to wear and tear. So just the telescopic antenna, you got to be very careful and pull it out really slowly. I'm not going to turn it on, but Gary, he upgraded it from the old antenna to the screw antenna. And he gave it new labels to make it look nice and new. So it looks good as new. Uh, it's, it's an amazing product. This is the top of the line professional model. And it has the REM pod feature, has the temperature, has a laser grid, which I've only used a couple times. And I got confused with the temperature. It has a temperature meter. And when the temperature meter was going off, I thought it was the laser because I had both of them on at the same time. These uh, four features on the back, you got to test them out and play with them and get used to them. But it's an amazing device that I use for detecting static electricity fields with the antenna, temperature with this antenna, and mostly electromagnetic field radiation. And it's a really cool device. I own two of them. Me and Brandon Young, <sighs> I'm going to have to figure out how to have two people. It's possible. It's doable. I could do it on Skype. I can do it here. But you have to set it up. You got to know how it works. And uh, it, it's a complicated procedure. But I do know I've seen enough. I'm going to have to watch a walkthrough. I'm going to have to watch a how-to. But at the Grist Mill, me and Brandon primarily used this device, but we used a couple others as well. But this is the device, the Paranologies Periscope. I guess it says Periscope right there. It says Paranologies right there. You turn it on, and it detects static fields. Like if you rub a balloon next to another balloon and you put it over, you would see sporadic, ch -ch 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 -ch. but... Unless you move that balloon really slowly, you wouldn't get the effect that the spirit set the device off at. The spirit is really calculated by going do 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 
and then just the colors, it goes this slow. And you can see that it's intelligently being set off. And so I thought that was interesting that the spirit is open to intelligently setting it off. Um, Brandon picked it up and um, put it down. We walked away from it 10 feet away, maybe 15 feet at the most and it would set off. Sometimes we had to wait one minute, sometimes two or three or four, five minutes. The first time we waited a considerable amount of minutes, and then we waited like 20 minutes and nothing happened for like 20 minutes straight. And then I walked up to it and I picked it up just to make sure it's working, make sure the batteries aren't dead. And I, I rubbed my sleeve against my shirt and it was hard to do it. I had to just build up static in my hand, and eventually I was able to sporadically get it to go just to show that it works. And then I set it down, and I walked back 10 feet, and about one to two minutes later, the spirit set it off. So the spirit almost reacted to, oh, you set it off? I'll set it off. You set it off? I'll set it off. That's the first time I've ever noticed that. It was a groundbreaking piece of information. Me and Brandon Young saw it firsthand. I asked Brandon to do it. Brandon picked it up. He set it off. Just a little bit of ch -ch -ch, uh, random static off his hand. And it was hard to do it. it. It wasn't easy to build up the static, but static is all over the human body. And so you can eventually get it to work. And then he put it down and he one time it went off pretty close. But he did it a good three times, I think, maybe four, and uh, walked back, sometimes one, two, three, four, five minutes, and the spirit would set it off. And I noticed Brandon's hand was a little shaky. He was holding the main camera, and I wanted to show the footage. I, I even put the footage on this laptop so I could use the Google Hangouts feature of share screen and unfortunately, I don't think there's a share screen feature with this live uh, live streaming. It's called live streaming. It's the live streaming option, a pretty generic name. Um, I don't see any features to share anything. It's unfortunate. It's too bad. It's what it is. But um, – Brandon set it off a good number of times. His hand was shaky. I don't know if he was tired, but I noticed when the spirit was setting it off, I looked in the viewfinder, and I saw Brandon wasn't even getting the thing in full view. Like half of the device was cut off. He was viewing like this part when the spirit was setting it off up here. So I uh, said, can I hold that camera? And then I proceeded to touch it, show it went off, walk back 10 feet, and film it with a steady precision. And that's the only reason I did it multiple times, but this is the first time we found out that you touch it, you set it off, you walk back, the spirit copies you. The spirit repeats uh, like a Simon Says game, but it's not fun in games. Like Brandon's testimony said, it's kind of a terrifying atmosphere it's kind of a scary atmosphere. Um, it's a familiar atmosphere. He rem it reminded him of playing with the Ouija board years ago. And I have equated ghost investigation devices like this as electronic Ouija boards, most definitely. You can make the comparison. I personally disagree with it being uh, necromancy. Uh, I personally disagree with that. I can't say that word too many times because I uploaded a video saying it like four times and psh, 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 not the best and uh, not friendly. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to try to say positive words, positive things. It was a successful investigation. A good seven times the spirit, the ghost or whatever it was, set it off. Brandon said he felt bad after the investigation. He felt bad, and I feel bad after a lot of investigations, too. You get amazing ghost contact, and then you drive home, and you're like, that's real. That 
was there. That happened. It's kind of scary. Um, if nothing happened, we probably would have been joking and laughing on the way home. Like, haha, we're so stupid. This place wasn't haunted. It was fun to try. Uh, but that's not what happened. A spirit actually set off the devices consistently like it has every five times I've ever been there. And I've mentioned to Brandon, it's kind of like a gold mine. When you find a location where a spirit is that cooperative, where it's always there, I think personally the spirit is stuck on that plot of land or assigned to that plot of land or chooses to be there, or maybe it can't leave. All I know is uh, it's always been there every six times I've investigated it. I've investigated now five times in the night and one time of the day. And the day investigation was quite a few months ago. I have all the timestamps. I have everything exactly categorized and organized. When me and Brandon went, it was August 18th of this month, August 18th, 2019. But technically it was August 19th because we got there around 1 a.m., and the investigation lasted about two hours. About 1 to 3 a.m. was approximately the time frame. We, I was planning on 12 a.m. to uh, 2 a.m., but we stopped at a saloon just for fun because we wanted to, you know, prepare ourselves. And, uh, you know, it's a cool joint to hang out, and we just... Whew, got ready. I wanted to like talk to the people at the bar. We're going to go ghost hunting, but we were kind of overshadowed by a uh, wedding party that showed up from a party bus. And so like a good number of party bus people just got from a wedding and they had all the attention on them. So even attempting to mention we're going ghost hunting, no one would have even cared all the attention. Who cares? It was a fun thing. I've never seen a party bus show up at that saloon. I've been to that saloon a couple times. It uh, It's a pretty cool place, um, but the investigation had nothing to do with the saloon. We get there about 1 a.m. Brandon is shooting, and I say we're going to go check it out. I don't know what he was expecting, but uh, I'm the 100% real deal. That spirit at the grist mill is 100% the real deal. Okay, I'm going to look at some questions. Bob Lazar, when is Bob Lazar part two or three coming out? I definitely am going to have Bar Bob Lazar part two and part three. There's a live stream, which was going to be part two, but I'll do a separate part two, a separate part three. Um, I purchased an item and uh, Red Bull. <laughs> I, I gave Brandon a Red Bull, and he doesn't like Red Bull, or maybe he, it doesn't react with him too well. But I love Red Bull. I could probably have six Red Bulls and not be affected too much, except for, obviously, being awake. But I didn't even need a Red Bull. I was wide awake. I have to admit, Brandon seemed like he was half asleep when he was holding the camera. Whatever the case, he saw it. It's the real deal. It happened. I drove four hours from approximately the grist mill location to Brandon's location in Encinitas, California. Then I drove and we stopped at In-N-Out Burgers. We got some In-N-Out Burgers. And then we proceeded four hours from his house to the grist mill. We, it was a successful investigation. And then I had to drop him off. So I drove four hours back to drop him off. But this is how it worked. I drove from the grist mill location to pick him up, four hours to take him there, four hours to drop him off, and then four hours to get back, and then I, had, I drove home. So 16 hours total just to bring one individual to get a second eyewitness to show and prove it's the real deal. No matter how skeptical you are, as long as you have a positive, peaceful uh, persona, mindset, aura, whatever the case. I'm talking, I would invite Penn Gillette, famous atheist, uh, his partner Teller, I'm sure is an atheist as well. They seem to do everything alike. 
uh, Ricky Gervais, famous atheist, even non-famous atheists that if you're an atheist and you're very skeptical, you're like, this is a scam. Uh, you're welcome to come, but you have to get there yourself. I, I, I can't be spending hundreds of dollars driving people there and it's not a scam. I would never charge to have sell tickets to the location. I would be open to bringing as many as four people total, including myself. I don't think I would ever bring more than four people. I don't want to overwhelm the spirit. It seems to be a spirit that likes solitude. And if it shows the location, it shows it because it's a very solitude, a very solace, very, uh, it's a peaceful area. Uh, but there's definitely a vibe that, ooh, this is, this is a haunted location. But if you're not open-minded to it being a haunted location, understandably, you're going to say, this is just an old building. There's nothing here. But if you have a positive mindset and uh, you talk to thin air, you're like, hey, uh, is there a spirit here? Because that's what I did the first time before I knew it was haunted. And I had been to the location, I think, three or four times in the day. My nephew showed it to me. And then we brought other family members. Maybe I went there another time. And then I took someone in the day to show it to them. And they said their dad had been there before. This was a local. And they had never heard of it. But their dad did. And most locals have never heard of it. I lived in the location for over 20 years. And uh, I moved there before Michael Jackson. Or, uh, I'm giving too much information away. <laughs> but uh, um, Michael Jackson was big into pirates. I heard he owned the Pirates of the Caribbean uh, replica or something. And he didn't know this structure is close to his Neverland ranch. He never knew. I never knew either until my nephew showed it to me in 2012. 2012, I went there with my nephew. He's like, check it out. I'm like, this is pretty cool. The plaque says pirate on it. It says pirate Beauchard, I believe, um, a Spaniard with a Spanish galleon off the West Coast, which is rare. I didn't know Spanish galleons went to the West Coast, but I did go on a tour of Mission Santa Barbara. And in the glass case, you can see a cannonball. They have a cannonball and a cannonball spring. And I don't know if that was the mission shooting at the pirates or from the pirates cannonball that shot. I don't think they would have shot at the mission, but uh, maybe they found it at the beach. I don't know where it came from, but it's obviously an antique pirate era cannonball. And it's about this big. It's about this big of a cannonball. Solid. Looked like iron. Pretty cool. And there's a lot of pirate history uh, at Mission Santa Barbara, although they don't want to focus on the pirate history. They want to focus on it being a mission and the priests and this and that. Uh, but the ex-pirate, the good pirate, Pirate Joseph John Chapman, is the was the foreman who built, at least he was there telling them how to build the grist mill. And I believe it, the grist mill was used for grain or corn. We don't know. But either grain was in the fields or corn was in the fields, probably grain. And uh, it helped feed the mission. And uh, he left Pyro Beauchard, joined the Catholic Church. I'm not Catholic, but Brandon is Catholic, and I respect all religions. But Brandon was a little bit freaked out. And I didn't know Brandon thought it was borderline, you know, something against his religion. If I knew that, I wouldn't have invited him, to be honest. I don't want to force anyone to participate in something that is against their religion. I personally think when I'm investigating for a location, if it's haunted, I don't ask too many yes or no questions. I don't open up too much of a dialogue is there a spirit here? Yes or no? Can they prove intelligence? Yes or no? I, you know, in some religions, that would be considered really bad. In my personal belief, it's not. 
Uh, I disagree and say it's not bad, but I can see where it could be a gray area and it, you can't go down dark paths. So it's not for everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the faint of spirit. It's not for the faint of, of this and that. It's not for the the mind, the fragile mind. You have to be strong-willed and strong-minded to protect yourself against any potential uh, negative things. I haven't had anything follow me that I know of. Uh, Got to have this Red Bull. Need to Red Bull it up. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, Michael Jackson's birthday. I don't know. Is it MJ's B-Day? I don't know. Let's check it out. Michael Jackson's birthday was yesterday, or depending upon where you are on the planet, I guess it could have been today. August 29th, he... Uh, do, 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 do. I don't know. I'm looking at old, old Google things, not telling me anything updated, but... I should hunt for cryptids. See, I'm not a cryptid hunter for a very specific reason. Cryptids are physical, right? Are they or are they not physical? Cryptids, from the perspective of a cryptid or cryptozoologist, from the perspective of a cryptozoologist, it's just like a regular zoologist. They focus on physical animals physical creatures that physically exist. I personally think a good percentage of cryptids are non-physical beings, like the Native American shapeshifters. The Native Americans have been talking about shapeshifters for thousands of years. I think they know what they're talking about, at least. I think they know spirits can appear as animals. And uh, I just read a book. I'm going to do a book review right now. I know you don't like book reviews, but it's too bad. It's so sad. Here's a book called The Enigma of the Poltergeist by Raymond Bayless, a noted poltergeist expert. I wish he was still alive so I can contact him, but after Googling his... Life, I saw that he passed away. Rest in peace. I really would have liked to have met him, met him, and I'm sure, you know, I told it to someone. They said he probably would have wanted to interview you. I was a poltergeist victim of six months. According to Raymond Bayless, I was a host. I was a psychic medium, according to Raymond Bayless's research. I personally disagree with the psychic medium thing, but host and a haunted person as opposed to a haunted building, I do agree that is a good assessment of most poltergeist victims. It's usually the haunted person as opposed to the haunted building. Raymond Bayless talks about, on some poltergeist, he researched hundreds of poltergeist cases, hundreds. Um, on a number of them, an animal would appear like a black, a black werewolf-looking creature, maybe a white, maybe a white wolf-like creature. Different cryptid-type animals would appear before the poltergeist activity. They would vanish in thin air, and it was pretty obvious they weren't physical creatures. And that's actually fairly common in haunted stories. You hear about haunted woods stories. Uh, the Haunted Woods. You've seen it in many Disney cartoons. Don't go in this haunted wood. Go in this nice, positive woods, not these haunted woods. And the Haunted Woods, a lot of ancient beliefs around it, uh, before any haunted activity took place, they would see a giant black wolf or a giant werewolf-looking creature, different cryptid-looking things. And it was a foreshadowing of the haunted events that would take place. Uh, I do believe shape-shifting spirits do exist. That's my take on it. And I'm not a physical...
creature researcher. I'm a non-physical spirit researcher, but I do focus on the physical evidence that can be gathered by these non-physical beings. Even though they're non-physical beings, they actually are physical beings. Spirits are physical beings, believe it or not. But spirits happen to be of a different physical nature than us. I think it's because of the dimension they're actually in. They're overlapping our dimension from their dimension, from my perspective. We can see glimpses of them, either due to some fluctuation, maybe some... I, I don't believe in astrology, but ancient astrology talks about uh, the hours of the day, how a spirit rules this hour, a spirit rules this week, a spirit rules this month. It was more complicated than... Uh, if you're a Scorpio, there's Mars, and uh, you're going to have a great day. It was more complicated than that in ancient times. They would paint their wall black for Saturn. They would summon a spirit of Saturn, and the spirit of Saturn uh, was the dominating spirit during a certain month, a certain week, certain hour. I don't know the month, week, and hour. I'm not an astrologer of ancient astrology, but uh, that's what they believed in. And uh, I personally think these beings are physical. I think, you know, I used to think a spirit could shake another spirit's hand, and maybe they can. I'm not a spirit, so I can't confirm that. But uh, I think the spirits are more solid to each other than they are to us. But I used to think spirits could not, like, walk through each other, right? I used to think spirits, uh, and this is just generally looking at cartoons, looking at Casper, not really thinking deeply into it at all. I just used to think spirits interacted with each other just like humans act, interact with each other because we're humans, no big deal. A spirit to spirit, no big deal. But after I was poltergeist haunted in 2011, and I didn't research any ghost stuff, so I referenced Casper because I didn't research ghosts. Uh, I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on Back to the Future. I was focused on Clockwork Orange. I was big into movies, but more busting time travel hoaxers. A very obscure thing, because to be a good YouTuber, you had to pick a little niche thing that no one else did, and no one else busted time travel hoaxes. No one. So I wanted to do one tiny thing that no one else did, and that's how why I started Hoax Hunter, to bust time travel hoaxers. I had no interest in ghosts, demons, angels, none of that. I rent a room in 2011. And during that occupation of that room, during the renting, uh, it was 400 bucks a month. And uh, first two weeks, I noticed nothing. But five and a half months in a row, I noticed the corner was very active. The spirits would enter in the corner. The reason I know spirits can walk through each other is this. I pinned, and I've mentioned this story many times, but this is talking about how spirits can actually walk through each other, which is weird. It's a weird concept. Uh, but I pinned a green screen close to the corner of the room. There's probably this much that was not touching the corner. So it was off by this much. And I was going to shoot a stupid hoax hunter video. And I just put the chair in front and I was just going to say, I'm John Rimmons, a hoax hunter. And I didn't even know what I was going to talk about. I was just going to talk about random time travel stuff. But I was off put and uh, I was totally discombobulated and I was thrown through a loop. And I made zero Hoax Hunter episodes during the entire six months that I lived there because I was harassed by poltergeist entities. But when I pinned that thing to the wall, it was there for two or three days, maybe four or five days, nothing. But one day I came home. Maybe I was thinking about shooting a video, but I didn't. I was just maybe uh, thinking of concepts, what I should uh, of a good topic. And I was just sitting there pondering, you know, what should I do? And uh, the pin flew off the wall. And I used these giant oversized novelty thumbtacks. 
the huge thumbtack flew off the wall. I was holding the green screen with two giant oversized thumbtacks, which I still have in the garage somewhere. One of them flew off the wall um, at an accelerated rate, probably flew a good five feet. And I was like, that's weird. And then the second one flew off. And then uh, the green screen fell down. And I thought, oh, that's maybe I didn't pin it very well. Even though I was in a poltergeist haunted room and I've already experienced many poltergeist things, I'd never experienced that. So I always try to use rational, logical reasons for everything. And I pinned it and I watched. I watched uh, from the other side of my bed, but I had a good view of the whole thing. And it happened a second time within two minutes. The pin flew, and I wanted to know how it flew. And I saw feet prints because the green screen was an extra long one, way too long for my room. And it extended feet down from the carpet. So there was feet extending down. And I saw on that extended part of the green screen, I saw feet impressions of a poltergeist. But I saw specifically what looked like two small feet and they looked like human feet. They didn't look like hooves. If I wanted to make a good story, I would say it was demon hooves, but no, they look like small human feet, but they looked like bare feet. I have to say they looked like bare shoeless, small human feet and they were invisible. All I could see was the impression 100% invisible. This poltergeist was always invisible and Many cases in this poltergeist book, that's what a poltergeist is. It's an invisible force moving things. Rarely is there an apparition associated with it, but when there is, it's, uh, it's interesting. But So the two feet, it looked like they jumped up and jumped down. And while the feet are making the impression, the feet are there the whole time. I see a second set of feet jump on top of those feet, pressing it down even more. And the green screen was against the wall like this. Here's the wall, and here's the green screen. So there was some leverage right there. And the spirits used the leverage to yank the top of the pins off the wall. And that's how they did it. They didn't, they didn't pick the pins off and throw them. They literally jumped up and down, but they jumped up and down in their own feet. Feet prints down, and then another one, feet print even further down. That's when I knew they could stack on top of each other. Very bizarre, very strange. Spirits can stack on top of each other. I think poltergeist specifically. Now I know that it was two indi individual poltergeists. They... Uh, almost increased their ability to move objects by stacking on top of each other. I always thought it was one spirit until really pondering the two set of feet prints, but they stood inside of each other. It sat on a pillow two times. It grabbed my throat with three hands, and there was probably four hands there, but I could only feel three hands. I felt one hand here, one hand here and one hand on my tongue inside of my mouth. But there was probably two hands on my throat. I only felt one, but there could have been two. I, I thought it was maybe a bizarre creature with three hands, but with the feet stacking on top of each other and it sitting on a pillow twice, I think they were taking turns on the pillow, and I think they were showing me it was two. Two spirits. It's very unpopular to say poltergeists are sentient, intelligent beings. But I was a roommate with them for six months, and so I know what it was like. I literally said at least twice, pay rent. You're not paying rent. If you're not paying rent, you don't have any say. Don't touch my stuff. Don't move my stuff. I pay the rent. This is my room, not yours. And that was one of the few times I talked back to them, but uh, I tried to minimally talk to them. I tried to ignore them for six months. But uh, 
<sighs> Any questions? Was I living near Earth ley lines? Uh, I have researched the location, but not on an Earth ley line level. I researched the north, south, east, west exact location of the corner of the room, and I forget what it is offhand. I compared it with this corner. This is the act, most active corner in my room. Uh, the second most active corner is over there, which is why when I did a live stream, I did it in here, and then I switched over there. I would say the third most active is there, and the least active is where I sleep with the bed. So the spirits that enter my room know that's my corner, and so almost opposite, they choose the opposite corner to manifest. Um, but in my poltergeist room, I had a computer, I had a stack of DVDs, I had a tripod, I had various boxes that were always pushed away from the corner, knocked over violently, and I saw it with my own eyes. I guess a good number of poltergeist witnesses, they leave and then they come back, then they see it after the fact. I saw it in front of my eyeballs. One time it knocked over the tripod. The tripod was sitting there for two weeks in the corner. And this would have been before I knew he was their corner. Tripod sitting there for two weeks. They knock it over and they knock over a stack of DVDs that was on top of my computer. And they would sit on that computer. I could hear them sitting on it, standing on it, jumping on it. I don't know. Because I couldn't see, but I could hear it. It sounded like a sitting, creaking sound. Uh, but Raymond Bayless, I read this entire book, The Enigma of the Poltergeist. He experienced sporadically, few and far between, a few incidents of poltergeist activity. And he called himself a poltergeist hunter. And uh, I would say... I'm a ghost hunter, a, a spirit investigator, a, a ghost investigator, even a demon investigator. But poltergeist hunter, I wouldn't like to use the word hunter because if you hunt them, they'll hunt you back. But uh, I am a poltergeist investigator. And even before I picked up this book, I, I bought this book at Bookman's, a local used bookstore, um, it was one or two weeks ago. I believe it was one week ago, last weekend. I bought this book last weekend. Uh, I was at Bookman's in the occult section. I always go to the occult section because if you find a hardcover book that's old, even remotely, even the 70s, you can sometimes get a decent amount on eBay for it. So I look for the hardcover, even if I'm not going to read it. I'm in the witchcraft section looking at a bunch of cheap paperback witch books look like they're made by hot topic wannabes and then i see this i'm like okay it's a hard cover let me check it out poltergeist and i bought it immediately it was only six dollars and fifty cents really good deal and uh so even before i bought this book i was looking for poltergeist stories and i came across fate magazine on ebay and i've heard of it but i never bought it it's an old paranormal magazine here's one example of a fate magazine i bought about two or three weeks ago i bought these two about three weeks ago i think maybe four weeks ago because I had this in my glove box during the ghost investigation. And uh, poltergeist in the bedroom. I thought that was interesting because I had a poltergeist in my bedroom. And this is a bogus story. If it's not bogus, it's just um, the conclusions are bogus. The conclusions on this one is just psychological. It's just psychological. And the people that say it's, that poltergeist manifestations are just psychological, those people are living in the X-Men universe, in the Marvel comic books. Because last I checked, telekinesis on an X-Men comic book level 
doesn't exist and is not real. Every single telekinesis experiment I've ever researched or was bombarded with on various paranormal TV shows, if you really dig deep, you get down to, eh, they can move a match one inch. That's not telekinesis. That's basically blowing air out of your nose. But the conclusion was some girl had created the poltergeist with her magic powers. I don't personally believe poltergeist activity is ever anything other than a sentient intelligent being moving it. Because I lived with them for six months. And I got to see their behavior. Even though these are invisible beings, I got to see how they reacted to me. I got to see how they played with my stuff. I got to see how they knocked over my stuff, when they knocked it over, how they knocked it over. I inspected everything, and I didn't make many notes because if I made notes, I felt like I would have encouraged them to knock over more things. It was very much an oppressive, demonic harassment from my perspective. I didn't want to encourage them at all. But I found this, this uh, notebook in the garage, and this is my notebook that I had during the 2011 Poltergeist encounter. And uh, it's just random poems, random stories. Um, I'm seeing a setup of some random music, because I did make a couple songs when I was in there. And I did want to write something on time travel when I was in there, but I was totally, my mind was totally changed. I was like, hmm, maybe I, maybe I should do something on this poltergeist stuff, but I didn't want to research it. I wasn't into it. Let me flip to like the one page where I actually wrote something down on uh, the poltergeist activity. Like, I don't know. I was designing different stools I was a million miles away of wanting to investigate poltergeists, but because I looked through all my documents, I couldn't find anything. I designed uh, a really bad watch, and uh, but I found one page where I uh, mentioned the poltergeist and what it maybe maybe I was making a list of what it knocked over or something like that. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. Uh, I was make, trying to make a logo for my ZD27. See, I was making clockwork orange um, eyeball cuffs. Just trying to make extra money. And um, in a creative way, you know. Okay, wow. Here it is. So this was four months in. I wrote this down after four months of poltergeist activity. Here's one of the very few notes I ever made on the poltergeist attacks. So I didn't document it very well at all. I never filmed it. People say, eh, if you didn't film it, and then your story's thrown out the window, dude. But the thing is, I didn't want to encourage it. I considered them demons, or I considered it one demon, an imp demon. It had the weight of about three feet tall, maybe two and a half feet tall. When it jumped on top of me and grabbed me, I could feel weight, which didn't seem very tall. You know, every single story in this Poltergeist book, dating back to 300-something A.D., they didn't film it. They didn't film any of their encounters. Some of these are from the 60s. They didn't film anything. It doesn't mean their stories aren't true. This is one of the very few documents of me actually writing down. This page will be in my book, and I am writing a book, Corners of Rooms, and I am writing a ghost hunting manual ghost hunting booklet and I'm going to have that done before Halloween and I'm going to send it out to the 10k winners which were a handful of people I think seven people won so I'm going to ship those seven if your address is still your address 
you're going to have to email me, or I will email. I'll say, is this still your current address? But I'm going to make maybe 100 copies of my ghost hunting booklet. And if I sell those, it'll help me to write and publish. I'm already writing it, but the motivation is I need money to print it up. But I think I've saved up enough to perhaps print up a very small amount. I might do a GoFundMe. But who's going to donate to a GoFundMe or pay for a Kickstarter of a poltergeist book? Not too many people are into the subject, and I wasn't into it either. But it happened to me, and I consider it i consider it now one of the most, the most important event that ever happened in my life. So I'm looking at this. I'm seeing it did pick up a screw in my computer. I've talked about that. It spun the luggage under my bed. I still have that luggage in my garage. What else did it do? Uh, pens, pencils, papers, plastic bags, cups, bottles, etc. Plastic objects, foam pillows. See, the foam pillows I had in the garage for years. In one of my past videos, you can see I pick them up and I show them and I say I'm going to do a recreate, recreation, re reenactment. And... Uh, I just found out yesterday, literally yesterday, that they were either thrown away or donated to the Goodwill while I was at the grist mill investigating a ghost with Brandon. My poltergeist pillows were thrown in the trash or donated to Goodwill. What are the chances I'm out of town and someone decides to throw away one of the best piece of – it's not evidence – but in my mind, it's the best piece of poltergeist history connected to that room because the demon poltergeist sat down on pillows. I saw the impression at least this thick, and I tried to push them down, and it was a considerable amount of weight. So I don't know if they stacked on top of each other, but I know that th this is the story. I walked to my door to check to see if it was locked because I didn't like my landlady. I didn't trust my housemates. Uh, if you rent a room, you want it locked for privacy. I got home from work. It was probably 6, 7 p.m., maybe 8 p.m. Just making sure my front door is locked for privacy. It's locked, and as I'm about to turn back to walk over to the other side of the room while I'm still holding the doorknob, I let go and I turned to the left and easily two feet away from me, easily one and a half feet away from the door. There's a box and these two uncovered foam pillows. One of them I was going to use to create a nice pillow for this vintage chair because I looked at the prices of pillows for these chairs and they were like a hundred bucks a piece. I'm like, I can make my own. So I went to garage sales. I went to thrift stores. I found two pillows with really bad covering, but the shapes were right. So I ripped off the bad covering. And um, one of them was plaid and like dirty. One of them I think was corduroy, really old 70s looking pillows. And I just left them uncovered for a long time. I had them sitting there for a good amount of time. The poltergeist sat down on it, depressed it this far, right in front of my face. And it was about 30 seconds he was sitting on it. And then it got up. I've told this story many times, but I consider it important. A few seconds went by, maybe 10 seconds, and then it sat down a second time for 30 seconds. And then it got up. And I've said in the past, it looked like a small butt impression, but... More specifically, it wasn't a naked butt. It was a really round, and after analyzing and thinking about the picture of what I saw, because I have a pretty good memory, especially of events, events I consider important, I believe it was robed. I think it was wearing a robe, because it had the look of a robe, because just the legs and the butt was just one continuous it gave the impression of wearing a robe 
So these little poltergeist demons were two to three feet tall, wearing robes. Even though they're invisible, they're wearing robes. That's interesting. But uh, I had those for many years. They were literally donated to Goodwill or thrown in the trash two weeks ago by someone who cleaned out the garage. They were looking to make space for the cars, and uh, they said, can we throw out this and that? I said, don't throw away my good stuff, uh, but if it's garbage, go ahead. I didn't think about the pillows. I had them securely on top of a shelf. I didn't know they were going to go on top of that shelf. That wasn't obstructing anything, but they did. They threw it away because it looked like trash to them. I cared about those pillows for a recreation, just historical reasons so much. I drove to the Goodwill at 8.30. They closed at 9. And I went to the Goodwill to see if they were selling these pillows, which wouldn't be too desirable because they're uncovered. And they're yellow. And they look gross. And uh, I couldn't find them. I couldn't see them. I could only see covered pillows at the Goodwill. I think they're so cruddy that even the goodwill threw them in the dump. So I think they're at the dump, and I'll never see them again. It's too bad. Okay, we got uh, green screen sheet tacked to wall. We have camera on tripod fell onto stack of CDs, DVDs on top of tower computer. Stack of boxes in closet. Teetering objects. Every surface in room excepting my corner. Wow. So every surface in the room excepting my corner with my bed. And my bed had its own bedside table. So my side, my corner with my bedside table with the fan seemed to be undisturbed. And I bought that fan so I could put it on max volume. So... At night, I bought a second pillow, and I this fan was loud. It's like very loud, and I put a second pillow over my head so I wouldn't hear the objects thrown around. People that say, eh, you just made that up, man. You just made it up. People that say that, you know, I bought this Poltergeist book by Colin Wilson. Maybe I will do a more proper book review of this book. There's really a bunch of interesting stuff in there. Um, here's a poltergeist book I bought entitled The Story of the Poltergeist Down the Centuries. And here are the Fate magazines that I purchased. You already saw this one. This one's a very interesting in encounter. A poltergeist that broke the rules. This poltergeist walked around the town and did whatever it wanted. And it wasn't connected with the human. It just considered the whole town, eh, it just, it will walk around and do whatever it wanted. But it was connected with like a shed or an old structure that it preferred. But it would walk around the town and then go back to its shed. So this is a very unusual poltergeist encounter, which proves it was a sentient, intelligent, independent being, not connected to any human. So this is very interesting. I already talked about this one. I don't want to go into detail because the conclusion is pretty bogus from my perspective. But I bought this entire stack of fate magazines because poltergeists were mentioned on the cover. Poltergeist stories. I'm not a fan of poltergeist stories. I've seen Poltergeist by Steven Spielberg um, once. I've only seen that movie once. I wouldn't say I'm a fan of the movie. Maybe I've seen it twice. I've seen glimpses of it. Like, I remember watching the scene where everything's floating around the room, levitating. Everything's levitating the whole room. I did not experience that in my room. Zero levitation except for a tiny screw inside of my computer. But in 2018, at this desk right here, a poltergeist walked into my room and picked up my wires and dropped them while I was watching Netflix. 
I took off my headphones. I looked around and I saw the wires in a weird pile. And it didn't register to me that they're levitating by a poltergeist. I just thought, oh, that's weird. What's going on? That's I don't remember leaving my pile of wires in an in impossible formation. It didn't register that it was a poltergeist until the entity dropped the wires. And then they were clanking against my desk. And I was like, whoa. And um, it proceeded to touch things in my room. But more specifically, that poltergeist had a way different personality than the 2011 poltergeists. Totally different. First of all, it levitated something, dropped it, and then it proceeded to walk around my room and touch things very slightly. I could hear small objects in my room being touched. Like, I would, if this was sitting somewhere, I would hear just a little bit of a little little bit of a sound on it and then i saw the wires on my floor and i saw them being impressed by invisible feet this was 2018 this was just a few years ago it was 2 days before my corners of rooms live stream and if i was inclined to make a deal with the spirit i would have said hey show up at the live stream thanks for being here but i immediately said I walked up after examine after being a little bit of setback because it's the first time it's happened since 2011. But it was clearly a different entity touching my stuff, the way it touched my stuff, walking around, picking up my wires, the way it acted. It was a different being, a different entity. I, when I saw it step on the wires, I immediately jumped up, walked to the wires that were impressed, and I said, "This is my room." I'm the king of this castle, blah, 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 blah. I said, yes, this is a messy room, referencing the wires all over the place. I said, but it's my room. Yes, this is a bunch of crap, but it's my crap. Please don't touch my stuff. Leave my room. And then I th thought to myself, oh, crud, I'm, I'm scaring this entity away, and I'm going to have a live stream in two days. I said, congratulations, you can move stuff. And I kind of pissed it off, I guess. All I know is before I had the inclination to want to really cast it out, it was already gone. It was already gone. I think even by the time I said, I'm going to have a live stream in two days, you can choose to show up or not. It's your decision. Even by the time I said that to the entity, it already appeared to have left my room. But that's the most I've ever given as an extension of an invitation. But the first magazine I picked up from this Fate magazine stack that I bought, and I bought this before I got this book, uh, The Enigma of the Poltergeist by Raymond Bayless. The first out of this stack, I just grabbed a random one because it said Nature of Poltergeist Intelligence. And I was interested in the nature of poltergeist intelligence from this other guy's perspective. I turn to it, page 72, and I see that it's written by the same guy who wrote the book, Raymond Bayless. I was like, wow, that's a coincidence. So Raymond Bayless, most definitely a poltergeist expert. Raymond Bayless has two main theories. He, has, he, he displays many theories. He does talk about, is it a demon? Is it a spirit, some evil spirit? Is it malevolent? He said most definitely, uh, easily, half the cases, it does seem to be a trickster slash malevolent evil. And he said, you know, I've had comments. People say, oh, only the name of Jesus can scare them away. And that worked with me. I definitely have used it. But Raymond Bayless said in his book, that one of the religious rites that was used was a uh, Indian, I believe a Hindu, some type of Hindu exorc exorcism rite or something, scared one entity away. So you can't just jump on a bandwagon and say, only this religion will scare them away. According to Raymond Bayless, many different religious rites can scare them away. Some can be permanent, some can be temporary. thought it was interesting, the first one I pick up, was by Raymond Bayless. 
I haven't had a chance to go through any of these other ones yet. But the month I lived with the poltergeist is this article by Susie Smith. I haven't read it yet, but I lived with the poltergeist for six months. So one month, six months, my poltergeists were extremely active, 10 to 20 objects a night. I wanted to talk about the grist mail with Brandon Young, but because Google Hangouts has been disabled, I can't invite someone to join us. I really apologize for that. So I'm going to do this talking about poltergeists right now. But uh, I'm looking for just a random object. So I would have, you see this table right here? I bought this table in Hollywood for $110 at a used furniture store. And the furniture store was an outdoor store. I guess maybe some of it was indoor, but half, maybe like 70% of it was outdoors. And uh, I bought this because I thought it looked really cool. It was 110 bucks. I got it in Hollywood. The guy's like, are you an actor? I think that's it. I've heard that twice in Hollywood. I've heard twice in Hollywood. People say, are you an actor? That's like a, like a scam compliment that everyone apparently says to everyone when they're trying to sell something. <laughs> anyway, I was like, no, I'm not an actor. But this table was in the Poltergeist room in 2011, and I had a cup with pencils on it, maybe a bottle of water. I didn't have this at the time. I bought this only a couple of years ago, and I painted it. But... I would have a bottle of water just sitting here. I didn't have this because this is from a concert I went to. Uh, hmm, I can't remember when I bought this, but I, I believe it was afterwards. Hmm, you know, it could have been. I don't remember having it in the room. Anyway, I would be on my laptop checking my email, playing a video game, watching a movie, and either in my peripheral or immediately in my view of vision. Because this table was in the other corner near the near the door, exactly in my vision. And I would see that. I would see as blatant as that, that hard, that strong, across the room, five feet. Ten to twenty times a night. And I would say 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. was the window. I worked nine to five. But really recalling the best I can on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, I didn't work. And so I was there sometimes the entire day, Saturday and Sunday, and really thinking I don't remember any activity outside of the 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. window. And when I say 5 a.m., maybe rarely it reached in the 4 a.m. period. But generally speaking, 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. would have been the more active time frame. And Raymond Bayless talks about a time frame of someone else who experienced poltergeist activity. It was definitely close to that 6 p.m. to 3 a.m. time frame window. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, there's a house that was pelted by rocks for five months straight in this book, a story that Raymond Bayless personally investigated. He read about it in the Los Angeles Times or some Los Angeles paper. He lived in L.A. And so he really researched every single poltergeist case in California that he could. And he drove to this rock-throwing, stone-throwing poltergeist case, which he thought that's what it was. He said the article never mentioned poltergeist once. It just mentioned mysterious stones fall from the sky with an unknown source. He interviewed the cops who looked for kids with slingshots. They thoroughly searched the perimeter night and day. The rocks would fall night and day for five months in a row. A total of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rocks pelted this house. Uh, the owners obviously were distraught. I think they moved out. I, I can't remember the details on that, but uh, Raymond Bayless showed up. He saw one stone fall, and that's it. 
one stone. It fell from nowhere. He didn't see the source. The cops looked at a cliff a mile away and thought maybe the wind blew rocks from a cliff a mile away. There was a uh, artificial snow on a, uh, a ski area about a mile away, and they thought maybe the artificial snow blowers were shooting rocks out of them, but they were only in operation during certain hours, and the rocks fell outside of those hours. They looked for pranksters. The cops said there was never any proof of anyone throwing the rocks. And Raymond Bayless made the comment, it looked like they were thrown by a human hand, but no one could ever see that hand. And they were local rocks picked up locally off the ground within maybe one mile radius. Very interesting. So stone throwing, he said, is the more primitive style of poltergeist activity. And I can't talk about the grist mill. I've noticed at the grist mill two times stones have been thrown at the grist mill by the poltergeist, which I have verification via this and other devices, including the mill meter. I got a three-point-something spike in the window. I got a two-point-something spike very close, within seconds of a stone throwing that happened in the day. But the first investigation, um, the corner of the stone wall, I heard poltergeist feet walk in the grass up to the camera. That's authentic footage. Anyone saying it's not, listen to Brandon Young's testimony, which I posted on this channel. Brandon Young, he's an honest guy. He gives a humble, sobering account of what he experienced. It's the real deal. It's not fake. I brought a second person. They saw it. I'm curious as to what would happen if I brought three people, and I'm going to do an experiment if that ever happens. I don't want to talk about it in advance because... Sometimes you have to even be cautious of giving away plans of any uh, investiga investigations because the spirits, I think, always listen. All I know is this. Spirits have communication amongst each other. I think everyone has a familiar spirit. I think I have a familiar spirit, and I think it can relate information to other spirits. It sounds paranoid. But uh, I've seen enough evidence where that is possible. Um, but I saw a stone throwing, not as violent as five months in a row. But that five months in a row, that's all that happened. There was no apparitions. There was no evidence of a static meter. Um, so Raymond Abela said he was a primitive a case because there was nothing other than the stones falling. That's it. And he says, in some cases, it can definitely be a natural phenomenon of random things falling from the sky. He investigates fish falling from the sky, um, different stones falling from the sky, weird things falling from the sky. It does happen sometimes, very unusual. He says it can be a natural phenomenon in some cases. But he said stone throwing and poltergeists go hand in hand, very common. I saw the grist mill on two occasions. The first time I walked up to the window, I said, can you make your presence known? Within seconds, a stone was thrown either at the house or the stone wall for maximum echo effect. You can hear it on the video I posted. Months down the road, months, months down the road, I filmed at night, and then the next day I filmed in the day to investigate. I filmed the whole investigation. And uh, I walk, I, I pan, I was pretty far away from the house. I was like maybe 30, 40 feet away from the house. I wanted a full shot of the grist mill. And I'm doing something stupid like, this is John Rosmus. This is the grist mill. Something stupid like that. And uh, I turn on the mill meter. And I get a two-point-something spike off the bat. I didn't think much of it. And then I heard a stone or pebble thrown at the house. And then I turn, 
I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And then I totally forgot about it. And I had the recorder in the window the entire time. Actually, I need to listen to that recording audio to see if the stone hitting the house is louder from that recorder's perspective. All I was listening for in the recorder were EVPs, ghost voices, and I heard nothing. So I considered the investigation a failure in the day. And most definitely, night investigations are usually more active. So I wasn't there in the day to really investigate that much. I really just wanted to get a day shot with the grist mill so I could get a really good intro to the documentary. And this will all be compiled in the documentary of the grist mill. And Brandon Young is on night four. Is it going to be a night six? I hope so. But at some point, I need to wrap it up. I can easily make a part two in the future. But I need to wrap it up so people can see A to Z what happened. But two stone throwings, one at night, one in the day. And uh, I didn't think much of the stone throwing of the day. I totally forgot it about it until I looked at the footage a couple weeks ago. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And it was before I got this book. So I have some notes about this book, but let me let me show real quick. This is probably a really boring live stream, but uh, I'm not obsessed with poltergeists other than investigating what happened to me. Before it happened to me, I was 0% interested in poltergeists, probably like you guys are 0% interested. 0% <laughs> interested. All I can say is this. My exposure to poltergeists before I experienced it would have been Steven Spielberg's movie, was there a sequel? I don't even know. Is there a Poltergeist 2 and 3? If there is, I did. maybe I've seen them once. I don't know. But my exposure to actual Poltergeist activity would have been few and far between on some paranormal show. Maybe Unsolved Mysteries mentioned it once. Maybe In Search Of. Maybe Sightings. Maybe some random unexplained TV show mentioned it. And as a kid, I'm like, eh. Not interested. Eh. And then they're talking about UFOs, and that was a lot more interesting when I was very, really young. I thought UFOs are pretty cool. I thought flying saucers were a lot more interesting than poltergeists. Um, I didn't buy much UFO memorabilia. Someone bought me an alien keychain, and my sister bought a UFO crossing sign that she gave me. But I was definitely not obsessed with UFOs by any means. I watched the X-Files and uh, pop culture and a few paranormal shows mentioning poltergeist activity and me having zero opinion on the subject. I had no opinion. I didn't know if it was real or not. Didn't care. I was 0% interested in the subject. Either way, whether it was fake or real, I would have accepted any show when I was a kid saying, it's fake. Okay. Okay. It's real. Okay. I wouldn't, I didn't care. I didn't have any opinion on it. But after experiencing, I bought all these fake magazines that all mention poltergeist activity because it actually happened to me. This one says poltergeist on a rampage. I'm going to read every single one of these. They're very short articles, so it's easy to get through them. Our poltergeist is a male chauvinist. <laughs> so I don't care. Uh, if, as long as it's a poltergeist story, I don't know if it's even real or not. I'm sure some of these are like a tabloid and a fake story. But the thing is, some of them mention the location. I know, uh, I believe this one mentions the location. And so, like Raymond Bayless, I can drive there, and I can see if the area is still haunted. I personally believe some poltergeists are there for six months, like I experienced, but they were f focusing on me for six months. I have been back to that poltergeist haunted house on Drake Drive, or Drake Street, or Drake Avenue. I can't remember which it is, but it's on Drake. I've been back about twice and I filmed with the Melmeter last time I was there I walked around the neighborhood 
with the millimeter at night. It was like 9 p.m., maybe 8 p.m. And I was seeing if I could get anything because I didn't do any investigations when I lived there. And I definitely didn't own any ghost hunting equipment. 100% of everything I've ever purchased ghost hunting wise is because I want to research and show evidence that this stuff is real. And I personally didn't get much evidence. Uh, I don't think it's there anymore. But I think some poltergeists are there for maybe hundreds or thousands of years. All I know is the grist mill, the spirit is there. And it does have poltergeist abilities. It threw stones twice. It walked in the grass once. That's all I need to know to know. It does have poltergeist capabilities. It doesn't like showing them overtly, except for in the grass walking incident and obviously the two stone throwing incidents, but they're pretty minor compared to everything else has ever done. It usually just sets off these meters and doesn't do anything else. It definitely doesn't leave any EVPs, which is unfortunate. I would like to hear what it has to say, but maybe it doesn't want to talk. I don't know. But here's one that is interesting. Tucson's Rock Throwing Poltergeist. Um, I'm near Tucson right now. I'm moving pretty soon. Actually, I'm moving pretty close to the grist mill. And just because I'm moving close to it, it doesn't mean I'm going to investigate it more. Sometimes when you move to somewhere you go out of your way to get to, you avoid it. Like if people living by the Grand Canyon probably don't, probably don't go to the Grand Canyon too often, but... Uh, it will open up more opportunities to, to investigate it more, but I'm choosing to few and far between go there. It is borderline dangerous because Brandon and I both felt bad after the last investigation. I have to admit, after every single investigation, I see phenomenal evidence. And then I get in my car and I drive home and I think no one's going to believe this. I got it on camera, but no one's going to believe it but the depressing thing is there's a spirit there. There it is. It's real. It's kind of a sad situation even knowing there's a spirit there. It seems stuck there. It seems sort of depressing from a certain perspective of there's a spirit. It's kind of creepy. It's not as fun and games as Ghost Adventures would have you believe, but... It is cool to get evidence, but uh, it can definitely have wear uh, on your, maybe your psyche. I don't know. But this Tucson rock throwing poltergeist, I'm going to read it. I have not read this article yet. I'm going to read it, see if the location is mentioned specifically, and I'm going to uh, drive there because I live very close to Tucson right now, and I'm going to see... If it's still haunted, I would say probably nine out of 10, it's not haunted anymore. But uh, I am a poltergeist hunter from the perspective of uh, whenever I hear a poltergeist related story, I have driven there. Um, the Casa Grande Domes in Arizona. I drove there only after hearing that the entity picked up a large stone and threw it and it slid across the Casa Grande Domes. Or maybe it was a piece of concrete, a broken piece of the domes. I went there. I investigated. I didn't experience any stone throwing. A bottle moved, but I think that was the wind blowing it. I'm willing to admit when it's just natural causes. But uh, my number one reason for going to the Casa Grande domes was that stone throwing poltergeist story. And then the comedy store, comedy club in Hollywood. The only reason I went there, well, it's not the only reason. I'm a fan of maybe the history of the comedy there, but the main reason I went there is the story of there is a poltergeist at the comedy store. It just wreaks havoc in the office there, and the office has been locked for 30 years straight. Because the previous owner, uh, she didn't want to handle it. 
She didn't like it. She didn't even believe in it, perhaps, except for the fact that she did, according to what I've heard. She did hire shaman. She did hire psychics. She did hire exorcists of this persuasion or another. She would literally try the gambit of different people to cleanse the, the building, and it never worked year after year. So she ended up just never opening that door. There are famous Sam Kinison stories of him being levitated, a different comedian being levitated. These are just anecdotal evidence, right? There's no proof. But it was enough to go on of me investigating the location. I didn't experience anything poltergeist related, but I did get a couple spikes on the millimeter. Evidence-wise, that's all I got because I wasn't allowed to investigate inside understandably. You pretty much have to have a TV show for any of those establishments to allow you to investigate them. But uh, let's see. Here's another one. What is the poltergeist story on this one? The artistic poltergeist. There it is. The artistic poltergeist. So maybe it paints paintings. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what that story is about. And if I'm remotely anywhere near any of these stories, I am going to drive to them. I saw a video on Tombstone, Arizona just a few months ago. I thought I knew everything about Tombstone until I watched this old video referencing the ghosts of Tombstone. And uh, there is a building in Tombstone that was known to have a male presence that would throw objects. There's a poltergeist haunted house in Tombstone. I think it was a business. And I think it shut down. Whoever rented it, it always shut down because no one wanted to occupy the, the space. And I recall driving past it and seeing it. It's just a shut down building. It's closed. It might even be boarded up. I'm not sure. But I live about one hour from Tombstone currently, and I'm moving pretty soon. So I have a limited opportunity. All I can do is grab the Mel meter and grab a couple different static meters and walk the perimeter, hopefully with no one watching. A cop will say, what are you doing? But I have actually bumped into the cops in Tombstone with my devices. And they laughed. They're like, ha, ha, ha. They didn't care. They were pretty chill. They were pretty cool. So hopefully that happens again. Or I just don't bump into anyone. But uh, I'm going to walk the perimeter of this famously. It's not that famously. It's pretty, pretty non-famously poltergeist haunted. Because only that one paranormal TV show, which I saw on YouTube, mentioned I'm more interested in poltergeist cases. Um, Raymond Bayless says, when it comes to haunted houses, haunted stories, haunted cases, the most complex haunted stories have a poltergeist. The less complex, really simplistic ones do not. I, you know, I might disagree with that if there's a lot of apparitions. Apparitions are most definitely complex. But he's definitely right. Poltergeist activity does tend to be more complex. And uh, he says there's a really distinct difference between a haunted area and a poltergeist haunted area. They're almost two different things. And you can definitely break them into different categories. I think some spirits choose to use the poltergeist ability. Perhaps some spirits don't have it. Some spirits like displaying it. Some don't. The grist mill ghost spirit, it does have that ability. And I will try to capture anything in the future. Okay, we have this one. Two Midwest poltergeists. I don't live in the Midwest, so I won't have an opportunity to check that out anytime soon. But I'm interested in any stories involving authentic poltergeist cases. Two poltergeists from Peckham. I don't know where Peckham is. Uh, sounds like overseas. 
but I will definitely check it out and read that. Okay, we're back to where we started, the month I lived with the poltergeist. And uh, nature of poltergeist intelligence. Raymond Bayless says the nature of poltergeist intelligence is either psychological or a, a, a dead person, a ghost, a human ghost. I disagree with that 100%, and I say it's something other than psychological, even though that's very popular, and I say it's not a human ghost. I think, personally, it's something closer to a malevolent, non-human demon spirit. Very unpopular, and even Raymond Bayless says that concept of it being a demon spirit is very archaic, and very barbaric, and a very ancient belief. But he does admit, even though it's an archaic, ancient belief, it doesn't mean we can totally discount it. Because some people are saying maybe the ancients were smarter than we give them credit for. Which I agree with. I think the ancients were geniuses when it comes to spirituality, and clearly they weren't experts with technology. But it doesn't mean they were stupid. They were a lot more in tune with the spiritual than we are today. We're very cut off today from the spiritual, bombarded by entertainment and electronics and all of our technology, our wonders of engineering. And it's like the Star Wars universe. No one believes in the Force anymore. No one believes in... Raymond Bayless is a member of the Psychical Research Organization. So he focuses on the psychic explanations. No one believes in the psychic aspect of things anymore. I personally don't like the word psychic. I don't consider myself a psychic. I don't consider myself a medium. But Raymond Bayless says anyone who has a poltergeist is a medium for them. And perhaps that's true. Um, but the poltergeist I saw sat on a pillow twice, or it was two sitting on a pillow taking turns, and then they jumped on top of me and grabbed my neck. It's not psychological because I can't grab my own neck and choke myself out. I can't sit on a pillow remotely. I don't have that ability. Someone with a god complex could easily be drawn and sucked into, I have magic powers. But I don't have magic powers. Though That was a separate sentient intelligent being that did that. And uh, I wish I could tell the world poltergeists are real. It's a real deal. It's a real phenomenon. But just the other day, I was going to make a video of uh, it's, it's a futile attempt. It's futile. I can buy every poltergeist magazine ever made, and they're not easy to find but it doesn't prove anything. From a skeptic's perspective, they're going to say I'm just a fanboy of the genre. I'm not. I don't uh, watch horror movies unless there's an occult aspect to them because I have bought a lot of occult books. And every single occult book I've ever read, I've been scouring them for poltergeist information. That's really the true reason I've ever bought these because of my poltergeist events. So I'm not looking at them from a magical perspective. Oh, how do you do this spell? How do you do that? Uh, what's what's the what's this grimoire about summoning this and that? Uh, the tree of death, the tree of life, the Kabbalah, uh, this and that, da-da-da. I'm not too interested in the magical aspect. I'm looking at any evidence, even if it's the smallest bit, concerning poltergeists. And there's one story Raymond Bayless mentions, which is a little unique, and I'm very skeptical whether it's real or not, and it's impossible to prove. But one of the stories in this book mentions a guy who claims he can leave his body. And uh, a lot of people claim, that, I wouldn't say a lot, but a, a decent amount of psychics and mystics, occultists, magicians, witches, do claim they can astrally project or leave their body. I'm pretty skeptical of that, but at the same time, I think it's possible. I even have a cousin. One of my cousins said 
he got up to use the restroom to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night one time. So he's walking to the bathroom and he notices his feet are levitating this high off the ground. And the second he noticed that, he popped back into his body. And so he literally went to the restroom as a spirit leaving his body. He was dead serious about the story. And he's not someone that has any religious persuasion. He doesn't believe in any flights of fancy. He's not a tall tale teller. He's a very straight shooter. And uh, I think he was telling the truth. So I do think astrally projecting on purpose or an accident is possible. Art Bell said he went to Paris, France. He was in a nice hotel with his wife and uh, perhaps a little bit too laid back. And he popped out of his body. And I think he shot up really high and then he came back. And so I do believe such is possible. But some dude in this book mentioned by Raymond Bayless, I can't remember his name. He said not only could he leave his body, but he could do it at will whenever he wanted. And he would try to move objects while he's in his uh, astral state or spirit state, whatever. He said 99% of the time he could not move anything physical. His hand would just go straight through it, except for on two occasions. He said one time he went outside and hit a big drum of water or something like that, some big metal drum. He said he tried to bang against it in the spirit state. And he said when he popped back in his body, he went outside and he could hear it still ringing. And he said the neighbors heard it when he was pounding. That's an anecdotal circumstance. I mean, there's no proof that story really happened. Maybe he just really wanted to over the top solve the poltergeist enigma for himself. It's an interesting story. And I'm not against the possibility of people leaving their bodies, physically moving objects, but I think there has to be something more to it. Even spirits picking up something. How does that work? I think they're in a higher dimension. I think their ability to manipulate objects in our dimension is very limited, which is why people don't fly off on the freeway on a regular basis. Although there is one case in this book where Raymond, was it Raymond Bayless or was it some other one? Uh, you know what? It might've been in this, it might've been in this story. I can't remember. I'm getting them mixed up. But uh, in one of the poltergeist stories, a poltergeist investigator of a particular case, he's driving down the road after visiting the poltergeist haunted house and all of his doors in his car open while he's driving. And he said, <laughs> needless to say, I'm not the cleanest. Uh, uh, I'm a little bit messy. And so when all the doors opened, all this stuff from his car flew out. All the papers and all the wrappers and all this junk flew out of his car. And uh, he pulled over and had to shut the doors. And wow, he said that was quite the incident. I don't know if that's true, but it is reminiscent of the movie The Entity. Uh, there's a actual poltergeist case of a woman who was harassed. Uh, it's a ways off from Los Angeles. And I do want to visit the house, but some guy currently owns it, and he probably doesn't want to be bothered. But I did want to walk down the sidewalk with my mail meter, but I didn't walk too I didn't want to walk too close. And it, it's a it's a it's a public residential area. I don't want to bother the guy, but if I'm ever in the area, maybe I will just walk the sidewalk. I don't think it's haunted anymore. There hasn't been any reported cases of it being poltergeist haunted. So the lady was probably a medium or a host to what she says were three poltergeists, a really tall, big, scary one, and two imp ones, kind of like what I experienced. I, I believe it was two smaller ones. And she said the most horrendous things happened to her. I can't even repeat them. They're that scary and that bad. But it's based on a true story. And uh, 
in her case, she was driving down the street. And I believe the poltergeist did try to get her in a wreck and crash her car while she was driving. Those are the only two driving poltergeist stories I've ever heard, excepting there's a famous motorcycle uh, myth, mythology of motorcyclists having a bell on the motorcycle. And if you ever see a bell on a Harley Davidson driving down the freeway, I heard the reason they have a bell on their bike is to scare off some type of road demon or something. It's like some weird motorcycle mythology. It's very interesting. I don't know if it works, but that is what I heard um, from someone who rides motorcycles. And uh, I personally think we're protected by angels when we're driving in our cars because there aren't any, there aren't too many supernatural car accidents. I think the majority of them are created by human error and even traffic light errors. Um, I know someone that tried to make a left turn, and the left turn signal lasted for one second. So even one car couldn't get through, and so that was a mechanical error in the traffic light itself. But uh, anyone have any questions? I really wish Brandon could have been here. And he is here. Here he is. Brandon, um, I'm going to have to download an encoder. And just like Twitch, I have to use the encoder and the encoder is a video studio, kind of like the news. And you can have four windows and four people or three, four people can talk to each other, but it's a complicated process. You got to give them the key. All four people have to have the same video encoder on their computer. I'm going to have to research it and they have to have it. And I could do it on Twitch perhaps in the future, but uh, we want to get it to work here on YouTube. But when I can get that working in the future, Brandon uh, can join us and tell us more of his perspective on the grist mill. And perhaps uh, when he's feeling better, he can talk about it more. I mean, we will see what happens. Uh do, 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 do. spiritual warfare going on the house i am on break at work right now so i won't be here long okay eastwood i'll check out your video on spiritual warfare in the house sure i mean um i try to keep the house protected In 2018, the demon that picked up my wires and dropped them, and then he proceeded to look around the room. I got the feeling that it was an uninvited visitor. Uh, to be honest, I think it was the, the, the corner of room. When I did the one video, the very first Mysterialis, and that device was set off, I think it's the same entity. Um that picked up my wires, but I don't know from a religious perspective, I could easily make the claim. And even the spirit could make the claim. Oh, these, these occult books give me legal authority to be in your room. And yes, I have a lot of these, some of them black magic books, but it's 100% for informational purposes. And I've heard that justification doesn't mean you're right and justification is a defense against the truth sometimes most definitely you'll hear unjust people make every justification under the book for why they can do this and why that but realistically i consider the information in some of these old cold books black i consider every single one of these books black and white information 
and I read between the lines and I don't accept everything. I don't, I don't accept 99% of what these books say, to be honest. It's that 1% grain of truth that might help, so, might help solve a mystery on poltergeists. And there is a book in here. It's this white one right here. And there's another one. It just repeats what the Magus says. The Magus is a very famous occult book, probably written by various different occultists, but uh, Barrett is one of the authors, Francis Barrett. And Francis Barrett has a little chart of different spirit icons, if you will, different spirit logos, if you will. Instead of a sigil, it's a little logo of an eyeball, of a nose, of a foot. And one of those is really reminiscent of something I saw in the 2011 Poltergeist Haunted Room. So that information really helped me out. It confirmed from an ancient book that people a thousand years ago did experience something and they had the same information given to them by the spirit. The spirit at the 2011 haunted room that I lived in, it shown or it gave me two visions the entire time, only twice. One of the times it walked through me, I have the ability to distinguish when spirits walk through me. And I think spirits are almost uh, surprised that a human has that ability. That's the only ability that I think I have, excepting maybe being a host for freaking poltergeists. And maybe it's one of the reasons I was a, a magnet for the phenomenon. I don't know. But uh, when spirits walk through me, I can feel I can feel them when it happens. It's an electrical sensation. Sometimes I react to it, but because it's happened so many thousands of times, I usually don't react to it. Usually when it happens, occasionally it'll happen when I'm just, you know, I'm on the computer, I'm just doing this, do do do. And then a ghost, or I don't think it's a ghost, I think it's a non human spirit walks through me. And uh, my reaction is usually nothing because I don't want the spirit to even know. But on one occasion, a spirit walked through me and, uh, it flashed a vision in my head while it ha while it walked through me. And that vision exactly matches a drawing in this ancient book. This is just a remake of a copy of a copy of a copy. But the original drawing is like from my thought. It's maybe from 500 years ago. I don't know. It might be medieval. So... Is there an entire conversation going on in the chat? I apologize if I didn't uh, pay too close attention. I'm not used to this new setup. I'm not used to this new format. But if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. We've been live for one hour and 48 minutes. So that's the only feature I'm noticing that's new that I've never seen before. It shows exactly how long I've been streaming. <laughs> One hour and 48 minutes. Astral projection is a well-studied subject. Many people are capable of out-of-body experiences. Many YouTubers, many forums and communities, millions of books teaching it. Why don't you know this? And then you make a little clown emoji. <laughs> Why do you know this, you stupid idiot? I'm a human being that just got some Taco Bell. I got the uh, potato griller when it was brand new. I told this story many times. I'm not sitting here on some guru pillow. I'm not sitting here with some fancy golden robes. I'm not sitting here in some Tibetan Buddhist temple on top of a mountain. All right. I'm just some dude in a room telling of in 2011 when I rented a room on Craigslist for $400. And two weeks into living there, demon poltergeists of an intelligent nature intelligently knocked over my stuff. And I've spent thousands upon thousands and upon thousands. I've spent a close to $4,000 on ghost hunting equipment. $4,000 on ghost hunting equipment. I've spent 
easily that more. I've spent more. I've spent easily five thousand dollars on occult books. Five thousand bucks. This book right here. Just randomly pull out one book. The Book of Death by L. W. DeLorence. This book right here is worth. I would say personally is worth two thousand dollars. I didn't pay $2,000 for it, but it's a leather edition, and it's very old. It's not a remake. It's a first edition leather edition, I think. It might be a second edition. I have to open it up, but it's too delicate. Keep it in plastic. And people say, oh, man, why do you keep your books in plastic, man? That ruins them, man. I mean, from my perspective, I do dust them and open them up, but... Uh, I live in Arizona where it's very hum it's very dry and other than the monsoon season it's not too humid and so far I've been lucky and the plastic works so if I move to the beach I probably can't keep them in bags because the humidity might destroy them at one point I did find bookworm eating or at least evidence of it on one of my books Luckily, it was one of my brand new books, so it liked the taste. It liked the taste of the brand new book that was just printed in India, and it happened to be a re reprint of this book, The Book of Death by L. W. DeLorence. And uh, it's around here somewhere. It looks like I took it off the shelf because I was going to do a review of it. It's around here somewhere, but I don't know too much about OBEs, other than my uncle experienced an OBE. I think it's my step uncle or great uncle. And he dedicated his life to trying to recreate it a second time. So it happened to him once spontaneously and he dedicated his entire life to try to try to get it twice. And I'm not close to him. He might have passed away. I don't live near him. I, I would love to have a conversation and ask him all he knows about OBEs. I'm not an idiot for not focusing on OBEs. You got to understand, I've never had an OBE. I've never had an out-of-body experience. Therefore, I don't have any books that focus on it. I do have books that mention it. Out of these $5,000 worth of occult books, it's definitely mentioned. I've read it maybe five times in references, uh, but I don't think I even have read a full chapter dedicated to it. And I was interested in getting one book on the subject because I do consider it interesting, but it's not the focal point of my research. Because like Raymond Bayless, who in his day called himself a poltergeist hunter, he wasn't an OBE hunter, excepting when it referred and related and mentioned poltergeist activity. So to outright say someone's a clown or an idiot because they don't focus on the subject you happen to know about, that's a very, uh, that's a very, uh, that's an obnoxious, I'm smarter than you. And it's a very common comment on YouTube. I would have to say easily 50% of the negative comments I get are you're an idiot. I'm smart. You're dumb. I'm a genius. You're a moron. Very common comment. And uh, it's a very narrow-minded comment. I experienced six months of poltergeist activity in 2011, but I don't consider myself a genius on researching all these subjects. It's just something I experience in real life. If you read Brandon Young's testimony, he went to the grist mill with me. I experienced a little bit of poltergeist activity at the grist mill. Amazingly, I filmed it. I wasn't able to film the rock actually being thrown because I think it might have been a pebble. Um, I looked for it. I filmed on the ground for a good 30 minutes looking for it and just scanning the area. It's grass and dirt. I couldn't find a single stone, but uh, the poltergeist found it. The spirit picked it up. The spirit threw it. Spirit throwing, very common phenomenon.
I'm not here to have an argument about OBE. I'm here to talk about poltergeist activity. Clearly, it's not something you're interested in. No big deal. Go over to the millions of channels which you've cited to me and talk to people that want to discuss your paranormal field of choice. I would say poltergeist activity is very un uncommon, very unpopular. And Raymond Bayless says it's the most exotic type of haunting. And that's interesting. Let me go through at least some of my notes on the book. I know people don't want to hear it, but let's go through it. On page five, he talks about creeks, poltergeist creeks. And that's something I've been mentioning for years. Poltergeists will sit on every object in your room or whatever haunted location they prefer, and they will teeter teeter objects until they can find something they can easily knock over, proving they have a limited amount of power. If they were all powerful and had unlimited energy, they would act like humans and they would just knock something over if they got mad. Or they would knock something over if they wanted to scare someone. But they don't just randomly knock something over. They first check everything in the room to see if they can knock it over. At least that was one of the ways I was able to distinguish that they do have limited energy. On page 15, a poltergeist speaks. And uh, I may or may not have a story concerning that, but that's for my book. But on page 15, let's see what the poltergeist says. Proving intelligence. Last I checked, your psyche doesn't walk around, move objects, and speak. That's what an intelligent spirit does of an exotic nature, because most spirits can't move objects. Page 15. What does the spirit say? Revenge. Sweet is revenge. The terrified family called upon heaven for aid, and the voice was reported to have replied, Alas, me knock no more, me knock no more. And all was quiet. So that is very peculiar, very weird, in the fact that this poltergeist speaks like Gollum, very poor English. He says, Alas, me knock no more, me knock no more. Referencing the rapping and tapping and knocking. Rapping, tapping, knocking, creaking is the most common form of poltergeist activity. I've witnessed thousands of rappings, knockings, creakings, thousands. Um, you can get paranoid and confuse the temperature change in the house and the creeks. And Raymond Bayless even mentions this. He said he owned a house that was particularly old. And he got used to when the sun set and the temperature got lower, the house would settle and creak. And he got used to it. He got used to the natural creaks of the old wooden house probably wooden floorboards. And uh, he said on one particular occasion, the corner of his room, his writing desk, he heard the, I guess he was a writing desk with a, like a school desk. You could open it and put stuff inside. And he said he heard it open and like slam shut and open by itself at like a 12 at night. He went over to it, saw it open, and he closed it. And then it happened again and again. I think for three nights, maybe four nights. I don't know if these nights were connected, but it happened enough times where he noticed it was a spirit. What Raymond Bayless didn't know was corners of rooms is a phenomenon connecting many different ghost stories, proving a 
intelligence, proving a connection of intelligence. My room has this corner all painted up because of my theory, corners of rooms, which I independently discovered in my haunted poltergeist room, but I didn't know it was a phenomenon that other people also knew about. All I knew was for 165 days in a row, whenever the spirits entered my room, they entered in that corner. They would knock stuff out of that corner, and then they would proceed to knock over objects in my room. Raymond Bayless only experienced it maybe three or four nights. He even heard a phantom hand rifling through the papers in his desk. That's pretty interesting. That is pretty interesting. Um, the closest thing I can relate to that is when it sounded like the spirit was rifling through a tiny drawer on my tower computer, which had screws in it. It was just a desk. Uh, it was just a tower computer with a tiny drawer. There was maybe three tiny drawers, and one of them had screws, extra screws for the uh, stuff, you know, the internal components. And it seemed to rifle through them, picked it up, and dropped it. But uh, that is very interesting how the corner of the room, and Raymond didn't connect it that that's where the spirit always enters because those are the only experiences he had with the corner of the room. But it's a phenomenal story, and it exactly matches my Corners of Room story, except his haunting was very limited. Only happened a couple nights. It happened with me 365 nights in a row. And other people have been haunted for six months in a row. There's a guy named Roger Morneau. Whether you believe his story or not, he said after he left a particular group, one of the revenge, one of the consequences that the group had on him was a poltergeist that harassed him in his room for six months straight. So there's almost some type of rule and law of six months. I consider it very interesting. And Roger Morneau's poltergeist was way more violent than mine. Roger had a book in his hand. And the book flew out of his hand. I think it was the Bible. And Roger saw his lamp pick up. It, what, it didn't look like this lamp, but perhaps it was a tall lamp. Maybe it was on a table. I don't know. But he literally saw the lamp lifted up, levitated, and moved to the other side of the room. He saw a picture frame picked up off his wall and... I can't remember what it did, but it moved it considerably, levitating it in the air. I've never seen such levitation except for the wires and hearing something picked up in a tiny screw box on my tower computer. Well, let's look at the other things poltergeists say. So this poltergeist is very interesting. And it proves you can cast them out. They called upon heaven for aid, and it worked. But it doesn't always work. With me, the poltergeist came back one hour later after I casted it out, proving it felt or it did have some type of authority to be there, some type of jurisdiction. Let's see. On page 21, it says there it was a monkey-like phantom. And I've mentioned the spirit that haunted my room did knock over stuff in an animalistic manner. I related it to a dog wagging his tail or a monkey playing with things and grabbing things and throwing things. I couldn't see it, though. But monkey is a form that's repeated on page 72, and there are other witnesses of a monkey-like creature. Let's see. Page 73, a white hand was seen manifested, connected with a poltergeist, and an arm connected with the hand. So two separate occasions. A hand, just like the thing hand on Adam's family, just floating around, picking up stuff. Very rare. I've never uh, even heard 
of a hand picking up objects outside of Hollywood movies. So that is interesting. And one, the entire arm was connected. So it disappeared at the, at the elbow, I believe. Uh, that's pretty interesting. Okay, page 74 is another talking poltergeist. Let's see what the poltergeist, totally different story, totally different case on page 74. Let's see. Okay. As we have read, the Indian poltergeist given in Father Thurston's collection appeared as a dark female figure that in answer to, who are you, replied, why, Father? Okay. So that's all that poltergeist ever said was, why, Father? It's interesting. Proving intelligence, specifically referencing the father that was talking to it. Pretty interesting. That's not a random psychic manifestation of someone's consciousness. That's a being exactly responding to someone. So let's see. Um, and you got to take these with a grain of salt, but you can tie things together. I was talking about Roger Morneau earlier. There's one story in this entire book with a Canadian poltergeist. And the second I saw the location, I immediately Google Maps it. For those who haven't seen my Roger Morneau videos, no big deal. But check out his two interviews. He was only interviewed on two really good video quality occasions before he passed away. And his last interview was very shortly before he passed away. Rest in peace. I'm not a member of his Seventh-day Adventist church. I consider the Seventh-day little line thrown in kind of a red flag. But because he experienced six months of poltergeist activity and I experienced six months, we have something in common. Very, humans, very few humans do. And so I thoroughly have researched Roger Monod's story to try to find evidence of this organization which believed in spirits to the point where they worshipped them. Not good spirits, self-proclaimed bad spirits, but he said it's kind of like politics, and of course they saw themselves as the good guys, and they saw the enemies, uh, which normally are seen as the good guys as the bad guys, a very common actually among a certain group of occultists. Blavatsky was a member of. They definitely reversed biblical things, which a lot of people don't believe in, but they reversed the Bible and made it the exact opposite and said God was the devil and the devil is God. A very well-known concept. Uh, Roger Monod says basically that's how they believed. But there's one Canadian spirit which I did a Google Maps on. And this is an ancient story. It is on page 103. And it says, the reason it, it jumps out to me is interesting because Roger Moore knows poltergeist that haunted him. Roger said he gave it permission to speak. He said, I give you permission to speak, spirit. What do you have to say? And that's, that's interesting because I never gave the poltergeists that bothered me permission to speak. I didn't know you could give poltergeists permission to speak. I don't know if that would work in other cases. It worked in Roger Morneau's case. In my case, I didn't want to communicate whatsoever. And I never heard of Roger Morneau in 2011. I heard of him maybe in 2013, maybe 2014, somewhere around there. It was one or two or three years after the incidents, after checking YouTube for just spirit-related stuff. I came across Spirit Worshipping Organization, a scary case Roger Morneau lived through. He said there it was in Montreal, Canada. But he said on Halloween, October 31st, they were going to do a ceremony, and it would really initiate him as a permanent member. 
He didn't know what they were, they were going to do, except there might be some extreme stuff. And he was kind of, obviously, he was scared out of his mind. So he never got to find out what it was. But it was in the what is it, the Saint Laurent Mountains. I can't remember all of these French words and French names. I cannot remember. I have a video on it talking about the typewriter room. You can search it up. Roger Marno's poltergeist or demon spirit typewriter room. And uh, in his story, there's a lawyer who used poltergeists to type up law briefs. Anyway, so in the St. Laurent Mountains, I can't remember if that's what it is, but I did a Google search of that location to this location and Montreal to this location. Understandably, it was like two hours away. But that is still generally, and let's look at the date. Page 102, a case in Canada. In Clarendon, province of Quebec, reported violent phenomena, including a gruff voice that spoke frequently. One interesting conversation consisted of the voice informing the family that I am the devil. A following statement claimed that he would have them in his clutches and not to interfere lest they suffer a broken neck. <laughs> oh my gosh. After one attempt to set the house afire, the owner asked the devil why he had been persecuting his family. The voice answered that it was continuing the maliciousness just for the fun of it. The former, the farmer asked that he thought it was not humorous to have thrown a stone and hit little Mary. Interesting. So this is a stone throwing poltergeist that claims he's the devil. The voice remarked that it had been an accident. And in spite of being, in spite of the girl having been struck Okay, so little Mary is not the Virgin Mary, but a little girl named Mary. In spite of the girl having been struck, she was at least prevented from being injured. The question was also asked, why had the house been set on fire? And the poltergeist said that the fires had always been started in the daytime and expressed sorrow over their occurrence. I don't like this story because... It never quotes the poltergeist's words in quotes. It just kind of streams. It just, just like stream of consciousness talks about it, not in specifics. And I like exact quotes and exact specifics. But here was the time in which this supposed poltergeist in northern Canada, near the woods, Similar to that location Roger Morneau talked about. Roger Morneau's poltergeist would have been in the 1940s, many years ago. He said he was quiet, dead quiet on the subject for most of his life. But I think it was the 80s or 90s, he started to talk about it. He wrote books on it, and he felt enough time had passed where he should mention it because it's important. And his case was in the 1940s. This Canadian poltergeist was on September 15th, 1889. So many years ago. But that shows that that area might be extremely haunted by uh, some type of poltergeist spirits. And according to Roger Morneau, they were fallen angels. Very unpopular belief, but that's his story. And um, he said it spoke. Roger Monod's poltergeist? I can't remember what it said, but okay, now I remember. I don't remember the exact words, but it seemed to have full sentences. And it said, now's your last chance. Come back and join and worship the great master. And the great master it is the devil in uh, Roger Monod's story. And Roger refused. 
He said, uh, I'm good in the hood. No thanks, son. He didn't say that, but, you know, he said no. And the poltergeist said, you will be poor for the rest of your life. You're going to have, you're going to be in poverty forever. And Roger Morneau said, eh, I'm not worried about earthly riches. My riches are in heaven in the afterlife, blah, blah, blah. So uh, the, the spirit was so ticked off that it was like, F you, but who knows what it said. But it was basically mad, and it flew out the window. And uh, I think he said it shut the window or it opened the window, something like that, as it flew out. But he was always optically invisible. So he only heard a disembodied voice. Very interesting that this Canadian poltergeist referenced the devil. Now, clearly it wasn't the devil. But I can see any poltergeist walking around saying, I'm the devil. Who are you to dispute it? You can't see it. We know nothing of these entities. They could literally walk around and say, I'm an extraterrestrial. And people would believe it. Saint Laurent or something like that. Yeah. You can see it in my, uh, I Google Maps it in my uh, Demon Spirit Poltergeist Room Roger Morneau video. I purposely didn't mention J.K. Rowling's Fantastic Beasts and where to hi find them in the title or the description. I purposely never mentioned that because I didn't want a bunch of Harry Potter fans to say I'm ragging on the movie. I think it could easily just be a coincidence because J.K. Rowling references Objects floating about magically in every single movie. Uh, I don't know what she knows about poltergeist activity, but it's a very common theme in magic. You see in Fantasia, Mickey Mouse waves a wand, and things float around, and the mops mop up the floor, and the plates clean themselves, and the brooms sweep the place, and... Uh, it's fun and games. It's happy. It's joyful. But from my perspective, there's demon poltergeists moving these objects, and it's never anything other than that. I'm pretty close-minded on that subject, and I'll tell you why. Because I lived in a freaking room with, a, with two twin little imp demon poltergeists. They had a personality. I got to know them. And they had spite for me seemingly every single night. Their uh, existence was to harass me, to be malicious, to be, be what they are, malevolent beings. And if I could ever hear them speak, I'm sure they would cuss me out. Uh, I did get immediate responses to them a number of times. I do remember saying something to them. I can't remember what I said, but seconds after I said it, I would see my pencil cup be knocked over. And sometimes the pencils knocked out individually one at a time. And uh, I don't remember every single thing that moved, but it is interesting. I made this list. This is an authentic list from the year 2011. And I didn't want to encourage them and I had zero prospects and zero interest in ever writing about it. Because at the time, I thought I was permanently doomed and cursed for the rest of my life. I didn't know it was a six-month rare thing. I thought I would have poltergeist activity the rest of my life. I thought I was stuck with it. In 2010, an entity appeared in my closet. And uh, things happened. And it walked through me, and it felt like pure hatred and pure evil and pure sadness, pure this and pure that, of all nothing but dark emotions. And uh, behind it, I could feel a trail of what felt like a thousand spirits walking behind it. And it turned midway in my stomach and flew. I mean, I don't know if it flew is optically invisible, but it... When it left my body, it left in the direction of the window to the left of the bed from my perspective. 
and uh, it moved the uh, cardboard box in my closet twice. It sat on the cardboard box in my closet, got up, and then sat on the cardboard box in my closet a second time is what it sounded like. And that is the foreshadowing of the poltergeist activity. That was one single night in 2010. On February 17th, 2010, I estimate approximately 11.04 p.m. I know it was past 11 p.m. I picked up my cell phone on the side table next to the bed pretty shortly after it left my body. And uh, it said 11.14 p.m., maybe 11.15 p.m. And I was waiting for a text from someone. It's the only reason I was wide awake and alert, waiting for a text. The text never came. Instead, an uh, entity appeared in my closet. So because of that, I'm sure from other people's perspective, extremely bizarre story, but it, it really happened to me. It's my history. Because of that history, I connected that being with the poltergeist haunted room the next year, 2011. You have to connect the two. I'm not a crazy person. See, every single room I ever rented or owned or moved into or lived in had nothing, zero, zip, zilch, nada, no crazy stuff, no aliens abducting me, no... Well, I did have a dream within a dream once uh, with an alien, but uh, that was a dream within a dream. I do feel it was a demonic dream. But I do distinguish the difference between a dream and actual reality. And that being that appeared on the cardboard box in my closet, it happened in reality. I was wide awake. The lights were off, and it was 11 p.m., but I was wide awake waiting for a text. The next day, I texted that person that a spirit uh, was in my room last night. And uh, I met up with them maybe a week later at Red Robin. And we ordered French fries and soda. And then we went to see a movie. But while we're eating French fries at Red Robin, I told her the whole story A to Z. And uh, I didn't know her mindset. I didn't know what type of person she was. I even was suspicious it was following her, not me. I don't know. I was paranoid. Where did this thing come from? Why did it choose me? And I told her the whole story A to Z. And she said, that's interesting. I said, has that ever happened to you before? I mean, this is bizarre. She said, yeah, all the time. And at that point, I was like, maybe she's crazy. Because that doesn't happen all the time to anyone ever. All right. Sure as crud doesn't happen to me all the time. It's a one time deal. Excuse me. I feel a little bit sick. Get some Red Bull. But she proceeded to tell me how, have you ever done shrooms before? I'm like, no. So she might have connected it to some type of uh, use of a particular substance, which I've never done drugs my whole life, A to Z. I'm kind of like Penn Gillette, Penn and Teller. Those guys are strict, nothing. And I'm not as strict as them, but um, concerning uh, substances, I can't even say the word because there's certain rules now on YouTube. But I've had zero my whole life, A to Z. Uh, I consider Red Bull one of the stronger things I've had in my life. Familiar spirits means they walk the earth seeking communion with us. Well, you're probably going to get a thousand different answers if you ask a thousand different people. But from my personal perspective, after researching it, even just one book, not even thorough researching it. I'm familiar with Aleister Crowley tried to commune with his holy angel, holy guardian angel, HGA. And after reading the words of his HGA, it's pretty crystal clear his HGA is a negative entity 
if it's real or it's just a negative thought if it's not real. Either way, it's a negative thing. And um, that is probably one of the first places I got the concept of perhaps everyone has a familiar negative spirit that follows them from birth to death. And then reading all these books, I didn't get much, but maybe one or two clues of the same thing. A holy guardian angel separate of the occult HGA, but actually just a regular guardian angel, is a very familiar concept everyone's heard of. But then I did the connection of the angel on one shoulder, the devil on the other shoulder, and researching yin and yang, there's an opposite to everything. I came to the conclusion, if there's a guardian angel of positive following you from birth to death, there has to be a negative one following you from birth to death as well. Otherwise, it wouldn't be fair. There has to be yin and yang. And that's where I came up with the conclusion, everyone has a familiar spirit that follows them. Separate from my theory, other people have a similar belief. Other people believe in similar things. But uh, it's not as common as the familiar spirit talked about among, amongst witches. Witchcraft amongst witches, they will have two different types of familiar spirits. They'll have a black cat, which is considered their familiar spirit. Or they'll have an owl considered their familiar spirit which they use as a medium or as protection. And then they'll have invisible familiar spirits they can command. And there's a book in here which shows them. Actually, here's the cover of a book. Uh, it's called The Fairfax Demonologia. And I bought this book because of the cover. And it's a good cover, but there's not much information concerning the cover, which is unfortunate. But I found this same woodcut in a separate occult book. You see these different creatures? This is a witch, and these are her different familiar spirits. And none of them are in a humanoid form. They're all in different animal forms. We have a seal... We have a fish, we have like a pig, we have some type of dragon pig, just different dog pig, monkey, little lizard, little porcupine, hedgehogs, just random little animals. And if they're invisible and they harass you, sure, they might as well be. Uh, it's interesting. Here's a, here's a monkey one. I know there's a guy on YouTube that said he noticed uh, something in the corner of his room, and uh, I think his name is Thomas Sheridan. I think I asked him about it, and I think he ignored me. But perhaps he just doesn't check his social media, so it's no big deal. But Thomas Sheridan said that uh, a little tiny dresser in his corner of his room picked up and threw itself at him. And he has this dresser on top of him that came from the corner of the room. He's like, what the hell? What? So a poltergeist literally threw the entire dresser on him. On a separate occasion, a monkey appeared on him, choking him, or something similar to my story. I don't know if he was choking him, but I think maybe it was like banging on him or something. He grabbed the monkey and threw it against the wall. And he, he said it was a monkey-like creature. It wasn't actually a monkey. It was clearly a spirit. Um, but it manifested in a physical form, which I've never experienced except for when it choked me. But when it choked me, I tried to push it off. And my hands went through the entity. When my hands went through the entity, I could feel uh, what felt like a, an electrical field. But I couldn't push it. It was like 
attached to my body. I literally couldn't push it off. But in Thomas Sheridan's case, he grabbed the monkey, threw it against the wall, and the second it hit the wall, it vanished and disappeared. So that's very interesting. He was able to actually physically touch it. I wonder if he was in a trance-like state during that. Maybe it was his astral self grabbing it. I don't know. Whitley Strieber, Communion. Um, I don't know why Whitley Strieber called his book Communion. I don't know. But uh, he always called his aliens the visitors. He never called them aliens. He knew that they looked like gray aliens, but he was very specific in saying he called them the visitors one time, at least in the movie. I've never read, to be honest, I've never read his book, The Communion. I've watched the movie starring Christopher Walken, which is a very underrated movie. It's very interesting. And when you think of the entities as being spirits instead of aliens, there's a lot of spiritual-looking uh, stories. It peeks behind his dresser in the corner of his room. And it looks like he has visions as opposed to actual experiences. It looks like he's in a dream state when he's in their flying saucer. Or spaceship. I don't think it's even saucer shaped. It's a weird shaped thing. And he asks them to take their mask off. They take it off and there's like some demon reptile fake face. And he keeps saying, no, show me your real face. And they never do. So even he recognized that alien mask was a facade. But I, I don't know. Uh, I had a, a dream of a... It was probably in 2002. I had a dream of a, a dream within a dream. And uh, it was pretty interesting. I went to bed. And... Uh, I sensed something. Oh, no, no. Okay, okay. I always cut this part out because I cut to the prominent part. Okay, I had a dream. And in the dream, it was like a nightmare. Something horrific took place. Play. I don't know what it was. Like a monster maybe chasing me or just something scary. Blood and gore. All I remember is darkness, maybe red maybe red eyes, something over the top, super scary. And uh, I woke up because it was too scary of a dream. And when I woke up, I saw a gray alien at the foot of my bed. He looked about three and a half feet tall. He was literally at the edge of my bed, kind of sideways like this. And he was looking at me like this. And his eyes were half closed. So he had big eyes, but they weren't as big as you see in Whitley Strieber's book cover. They weren't as big as you see in movies. They were maybe maybe twice the size of human eyes, not like a thousand, not, not like 10 times big. They weren't like this big. They were only like this big, but still big. They had the look of kind of like a reptile eyes but still bigger than human eyes. They were half closed and they had a weird look about them. So I thought I was actually seeing an alien in real life because I just woke up from a scary nightmare and I saw this freaking gray alien at the foot of my bed. And then I tried to move and I couldn't. I was paralyzed, just like the classic paralyzed case of all these abductions. And fear immediately struck me when I couldn't move. Until I realized I was still sleeping. So I willed myself to wake up. And when I woke up, the room looked exactly like the dream, minus the alien. There was no alien there. But whatever this being, if it was real, a lot of people say it's just a dream. I will agree with the people who say it's just a dream. Maybe it was just a dream. Maybe the fear and the demonic feeling was 
when I legitimately did have sleep paralysis and I tried to move and I couldn't because I didn't know I was sleeping. But it's the only dream within a dream I can ever remember ever having. Very rare, very unusual. So I didn't ever see an alien other than inside of a dream. It was a dream within a dream. And it exactly matched my room. It's pretty unusual to have a dream where it exactly matches your room. Pretty unusual. I guess it's possible I have had a dream matching my room, perhaps maybe once or twice, but never inside of another dream having woke up from another dream. That's very Inception-like. And uh, I have to say, it was before I watched the movie Inception. I never even heard of the movie Inception in 2002. I don't know if he was out in 2002, but pretty interesting. Okay, two hours and 35 minutes. Let me just finish the notes real quick. Corners of Rooms story starts on page 142, I think. Okay, 187. He has a really interesting point, Raymond Bayless. On 187, he says something I've never heard before, which could boost my ego, but I take it with a grain of salt and don't consider it fact. It's just interesting. One eighty-seven. He says, "Mystics are prone to hauntings." He says that basically, mystics and saints, and people of great pious worshipfulness, whatever their religion may be, if they follow it to a T exactly. I don't think it matters if you're Buddhist, Catholic, Hindu, Muslim, a Christian denomination of this or that. If you follow it exactly to a T, it might make you a magnet for negative events because you're being tested. You're being tested above and beyond what other human beings are being tested because those human beings are being tested with the regular hum and drum regular hustle and bustle of everyday life. And if you can ascend above that everyday life and just ignore it, you're still going to be harassed <laughs> or tested by something else. That's a theory Raymond Bayless postulates, which I think is pretty interesting. But I wouldn't consider myself a mystic or a pious saint of any extreme degree but perhaps the poltergeists thought otherwise. All I know is it seems like the entity in 2010 was really pissed off by something I did. Something I did was something most humans wouldn't do. I chose a positive route instead of a negative route. The negative route was very easy, and the positive route was hard. And uh, I can't uh, go into detail, but... Um, I think that's why the demon poltergeist popped out, jumped in my closet. I think he was there the whole time. He, uh, I say he because I have great reason to believe he was a he. And I'll mention that in my book, Corners of Rooms. But uh, I pissed off a demon poltergeist. And uh, how many people can say that? You pissed off a demon That's a foreign concept. You sound like you're nuts. But uh, I, I legitimately ticked off a demon that I didn't know was in my closet. It decided to reveal itself, not optically, but only physically by moving or sitting on, my car on a cardboard box in my closet twice. So my ears really perked up. Something happened I've never revealed ever. And I've never revealed it because, and then it walked through me and then it left. I've never revealed the something that it did because I feel like occasionally here and there, there's some Hollywood script writer reading my, uh, watching my YouTube videos or reading whatever, I guess, my tweets. And I don't want to one day go to the movies, and this is obviously a long shot, 
But you got to understand, there's a dude that wrote a comic book called Hoax Hunters with an S. And I never read a single copy. I just read the overview of, of comic book number one. And comic book number one of Hoax Hunters, the comic which came out years after my Hoax Hunter YouTube channel, focusing on busting hoaxes, paranormal hoaxes specifically, and time travel was even the more specific. The Hoax Hunters comic book, I read the overview of number one. It said, Hoax Hunter team investigates paranormal hoaxes and finds videos online and bust them. And then they secretly create hoaxes to cover up the truth of paranormal events. And clearly, I don't create hoaxes to cover up paranormal events. That's the twist. And it's a very lazy twist that this comic book writer threw in after 100% being inspired by my Hoax Hunter YouTube channel. It's a tiny YouTuber channel that he thought he could rip off and get away with, and he did successfully. Congratulations. But he thought I wouldn't notice. I noticed, and I said, hey, what's up? And he immediately blocked me on Twitter, proving guilt. Innocent people don't block you after you're like, hey, what's up? I'm Hoax Hunter, Hoax Hunters. And then I tweeted him from Hoax Hunters because the original name for Hoax Hunter was Hoax Hunters. I have twitter.com slash Hoax Hunters with the S. And then I got Hoax Hunter without the S because I was going to have a team of Hoax Hunters. But because I couldn't find a team, I decided just to go solo. So he didn't know that he was ripping off the original name of my original show. Anyway, when I see stuff like that happen, I do get paranoid that maybe it TV or movie or author of a some freaking pulp fiction is going to rip off my stories. They can't rip it off of they can't rip off the best part if I've never mentioned the best part. So the best part of my entire poltergeist story, A to Z, the best part I've never told. But I can give you a clue of what it is. Page 194. This is the only clue I'll give. Page 194. Okay. Let's see. We got St. Benedict. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have Saints and Poltergeists is the chapter heading. Certain incidents in the life of St. Benedict are very suggestive of paranormal origin. It was reported that various monks occasionally heard voices, and they were interpreted as the devil quarreling with the saint. The devil opened the dialogue by calling St. Benedict's name twice, and then annoyed at the lack of reply. Asked why he was persecuted, the fiend also remarked that the saint was not accursed. The similarity of the devil's remarks to the voice that called Saint Venony by name called him a potato eater and threatened to get him is very noticeable and is thoroughly suggestive of poltergeist activity, first of all. This is a bad example, but it's the only clue I can give. The demon poltergeist harassing a saint, because probably he's a really good saint that actually follows the rules. Whereas most definitely there's probably a lot of hypocrite saints, self-proclaimed, that break the rules behind the back. And it's the reason why a lot of organizations of particular religious persuasion are seen amongst by non-believers as hypocrites. They'll see one hypocrite, two, three, four, five hypocrites, and assume everyone is a hypocrite. But even the skeptics and non-believers have to admit, there's one monk out there that A to Z did his best. There's one Buddhist 
monk out there that A to Z did his best. There's one Hindu guru that A to Z did his best and gave his all. And I guess St. Benedict was such a good dude that poltergeists harassed him. And they, and, um, they also harassed St. Vinany. So he must have been a good guy, too. And it's weird that this poltergeist called him a potato eater. So that was his <laughs> insult. <laughs> I guess St. Vinity ate a lot of potatoes. And from a poltergeist's perspective, a being that doesn't eat anything physical, it's going to take notice. This guy eats a lot of potatoes. So I'm going to call him a potato eater. <laughs> it's just really weird. He called him a potato eater. That's the words of a poltergeist and threatened to get him. I'm going to get you. <laughs> I'm going to get you. <laughs> wow. That sounds like a, <laughs> wow. That sounds like a pretty, actually a pretty calm, pretty passive, pretty lazy poltergeist potato eater. I'm going to get you. So that's the only clue I can give. So you saw the hoax hunter series. Well, the only Hoax Hunter series I'm familiar with is my Hoax Hunter series that I started in 2009. And then some dude way many years after made a Hoax Hunters with an S series, not knowing that originally I did register many Hoax Hunters with an S all over the place. We're talking across the board. I, I registered both at the same time, S and no S. But when I asked him about it, he had no response other than to block me. Okay, let's see. So, good receivers. Page 190 talks about how some people are good receivers of psychic information, of seeing a ghost, and some people are not. So, one of the saints, some father of a random church, he could see or hear a spirit harassing him and even people right next to him couldn't now that's an easy out for someone saying it's a psychosis but uh it's very common amongst ghost hunting ghost investigators you'll see zach Bagans will see a spirit in a room even one of the very last ghost adventures episodes zach Bagans said i see a girl I see a woman standing in that room. He said, I see you. If you're there, can you do something? And she, she makes a noise. And none of the rest of the crew could see her. She was 100% invisible to the rest of the crew looking at the same direction. So Zach Bagans does have a gift, unless he's faking it, which I don't think he is, to be able to see spirits because he said i see you and then you could hear something like a knock sound like a knock on the table or knock on the wall i remember there's an episode zach bagans and the ghost adventures crew are at winchester mystery house and zach sees a boy a young boy probably dressed in period clothes or something and that is known to be one of the uh ways the devil appears as a nicely dressed boy and uh something happens i can't remember what it is all i know is the rest of the crew didn't see the boy they didn't see nothing but they did capture a light anomaly in the exact location that zach claims he saw the boy so if a camera captures an entity it's either going to be nothing maybe an orb maybe a light anomaly Maybe a streak of nothing. You see a faint nothing of this higher dimensional entity. And only in the mind of the medium, of the psychic, of the mystic, can they occasionally see a projected image of what that being is or wants them to see them as. So I would say uh, 194. Okay, there's one more case. 194. Did I already do this one? Everyone's sleeping. This is a sleepy... Yes, I already did it. But on page 199, there's an interesting case. 
199. An early advanced view. Paracelsus, for example, advanced an explanation for hauntings and poltergeists, which is much like the view held by many spiritualists. He wrote in a book called De Animabus Mortuarium that human spirits may appear as ghostly figures or may stay unseen, calling attention to themselves by moving objects, knocking, throwing stones, groaning, walking, or whistling. Whistling. That's something I've seen on many a ghost episode of the TV shows out there. Now, uh, this book, De Animabus Mortuarium. I want to get that. I want to get that book. It mentions poltergeist activity. And Raymond Bayless, this is a very old book but it's an advanced theory. I disagree with it being dead humans, but some people can disagree. That's fine. I don't know for sure. I can't claim I know for sure, but just I, I lean it based on my personal experience. And then he talks about witchcraft. Uh, witchcraft and poltergeists. Can a witch send someone after you? And he says they vary. I don't know if a witch can send a poltergeist after you. All I know is in 2018, two days before my live stream, and I don't know the exact day. Um... I could look it up. Okay, here it is. It was the Friday the ter Friday the thirteenth live stream. Part one. Two days before this live stream, the poltergeist picked up the wires. Here's the exact date. April 13th, 11 p.m. is when the live stream started. Was it? Oh, that's Eastern time. So 8 p.m. Pacific time, April 13th, April 12th, April 11th. Interesting. So April 11th, 2018 is the exact day. And I recall it being around 11 p.m., maybe 10 p.m., I guess it could have been 10, 11, 12 a.m. Somewhere around there, I was watching Netflix. The wires were picked up and dropped. Did someone send that after me? Did someone astrally project and do that? No one's taken credit for it, so I don't know. All I know is my theory leans in the direction of demon poltergeists existing, having sentient, conscious ability to perceive the room, perceive what's going on, pick something up. And them picking something up is... They're, they, they're very calculated when they pick something up and drop it. All I know is it picked only one thing up, a handful of wires, and dropped it. I'm going to recreate that handful of wires thing, and I wish I could recreate the pillows thing. But the pillows were given away to Goodwill or thrown in the trash two weeks ago. Man, that really ticks me off because that's history. But I do have the table I had. I do have this chair I had. And I do have various things that I did have in that original room. And one thing a co-worker said, the, ve the very first time I ever mentioned my poltergeist incident at work, probably would have been one or two or three weeks after I've been having ha having it happen on a nightly basis. So I didn't mention it the first time it happened. I mentioned it after it happened enough where I really was trying to get help with it. And I can't remember what coworker it was. Someone I wasn't too familiar with overheard the conversation and he said, oh, is there a Maybe you brought something home that's haunted or cursed. 
Did you buy something that's haunted or cursed? I said, I don't think so. I seriously doubt this table, this chair, or anything I bought was haunted or cursed. I seriously doubt it. I think because of the 2010 demon that appeared in my closet via sitting, and all I could hear it was with my ears. My eyes were wide open, but it was pitch black. Clearly, it assigned those demon poltergeists to me. This stream has gone almost three hours, so I'm going to have to end it. Thanks, Thomas Walker, for the uh, <laughs> uh, comment about Hoax Hunter. There is going to be part two and three of the Bob Lazar Hoax Hunter series and i'm going to combine them and make it one episode bob lazar is interesting an interesting case i think negative spirits manifest in many different ways i think one of those ways is through spreading false information i can't prove this and that here and there but uh I can prove what other people have already proven. As far as Bob Lazar, I'm not going to exactly copy and paste what other people said. There's no point to that. Um, I like to follow my own investigation route and see where it leads, whether it's something I believe or not originally. I like to stick to the facts, and I am going to show you A to Z what my rabbit hole trail of Google searches led to. I did a search on Bob Lazar and a key phrase he mentioned. This is the same strategy I used with John Teeter, using key phrases. And Google showed me there's only 300 results. 300 results is very small. So it's very easy for me to see all 300 pages, which I did scroll through all 300 pages. And, uh, a story popped up time and time again. It exactly matches with Bob Lazar's story. And I have to show it. And I have to talk about it. Um, other people have already discovered it. But I have to show it and, and give you my perspective and throw in uh, something that I purchased to really make it an interesting episode. I try to put a lot of effort and time into it. But Bob Lazar Part 2 and 3 are coming in the future. Uh, hopefully Brandon Young can join us in the future. I apologize. He wasn't able to because they disabled Google Hangouts. But I wouldn't have purchased every single one of these freaking fate magazines mentioning poltergeist stories if I didn't have some obsession with poltergeist activity. And why would I have that obsession? Because it actually happened to me. No other reason. There's a lot of theories on poltergeist activity. And the super common theory is, oh, it's just psychological. Just, it's just psychological. And Raymond Bayless really nails down where this psychological aspect of poltergeist activity came from. It, from his opinion and research, came from Ouija boards talking boards, spirit boards, planchette, communication boards, whatever you want to call them. He's been researching, and he's since passed on, but he researched a good portion of his life on poltergeist activity. He said when Ouija boards were first used, and they weren't called Ouija boards, obviously, that's a trademarked uh, whatever, uh, was it, the... Uh, Parker Brothers, or whoever owns it. Talking boards, spirit boards, many different shapes and sizes, usually made out of wood with a planchet. Um, he said when they were first used, scientists and doctors were interested, and they wrote dissertations on it. 
and they wanted to know how it worked because they wanted to disprove spirits because they don't believe in it. And the mediums and psychics and believers and spiritualists, they, they, they believed in it, so they wanted to prove it's real. And the skeptics and debunkers or just the, the really skeptical-minded, scientific-minded individuals, they're trying to seek the truth just as much as anybody. And they proved that the subconscious does affect what you, what uh, A, B, C, D, one, two, three, what you move it to. Your sub subconscious does affect where the planchet moves. They proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. So I guess you have to wear a blindfold to really see if it's a spirit because uh, if you're not wearing a blindfold, your subconscious is going to move it whether you want it to or not. And I don't think all the cases of Ouija boards are fake. I think there's real cases. But because of that psychological factor, it throws out everything else. It doesn't matter if you can use it to contact spirits. Because the psychological aspect exists, it corrupts the data. And ever since doctors and scientists and skeptics made the connection between ghosts, spirits, and the subconscious, they then proceeded to take that subconscious theory, which they proved with the Ouija board, and interject it into poltergeist stories. So previously, when there was no connection of the subconscious and the psyche and the mind with a poltergeist story, Let's say a castle was haunted for 100 years and a poltergeist in a castle knocked over the knight in armor, whatever. There are many, there are thousands of poltergeist stories throughout history. Raymond Bayless says it's impossible to deny. Thousands upon thousands of stories, sure some of them are fake, sure some of them are hoaxes, but not all of them are. And there's way more evidence of poltergeists than UFOs, for example. According to Raymond Bayless, at least that's what I picked up on one uh, chapter he was talking about it. And uh, when the scientists and the skeptics, and the doctors, injected psychological aspects to the poltergeist stories, totally disconnected, they automatically created some type of fiction involving human beings having the ability to project a, a entity that can move objects. Human beings cannot project entities to move objects, despite that being extremely unpopular among, among um, pseudo psychiatrists or pseudo uh, doctors, because it's not real. I call it pseudo because if you can prove telekinesis exists, by all means, prove it. There's probably a, some type of amazing Randy million dollars you can claim because it's never been proven in the history of planet Earth, telekinesis. Although I do have evidence, at least I've seen evidence, that some kung fu, not kung fu, but martial art masters, Qigong masters, a very obscure branch of martial arts. I do believe uh, Dynamo Jack, uh, his name is uh, John Cheng, I believe, may have the ability to command spirits to move objects. He thinks he's moving them, but I personally think if it's real and if it's not fake, it's a spirit. And it's a very unpopular theory. But if he was taught this method from his master and his master was taught this method from his master all the way back 500 years, that perhaps 500 years ago, that master perfected martial arts of a particular discipline, maybe invented it, and maybe a spirit approached him because he was so disciplined. And maybe the spirit tempted him to, hey, you can knock over objects if you do this exact move. I'll knock it over for you. John Chang does a certain move. And even though he's blowing out, 
he's 20 feet away from something and it, 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 it clearly isn't being blown over by the wind out of his mouth. It's clearly being, being knocked over sideways. He goes, and these empty VHS boxes are knocked over sideways by what looks like a poltergeist. I've witnessed poltergeist activity. It looks very reminiscent to that video. I posted it, and it's all over YouTube. You can find it. But I don't think poltergeist is attached to it. It's Ki Gong, Master, John Chang, this and that, knocks over objects. And it's very fascinating. I'll continue to investigate the poltergeist phenomena, which I know to be 100% authentic. I'm going to go to various locations, not to hunt them down. And it's a pretty scary concept that maybe they're going to hunt me back just to investigate. And at the grist mill, me and Brandon were very respectful. We entered the area just like I had the previous time and said, we come in peace. That sounds like a generic sci-fi movie we come in peace but we come in peace we come in peace so we're going to be peaceful and respectful we came with that attitude we left it with that attitude the spirit set this device off six times is what i counted so far there's six hours of footage because three of the cameras run most of the time two hour investigation times three one two three four five six hours I haven't gone through all the footage. It's clearly mostly the same footage times three. But I wanted to capture it to the best of my ability on three true infrared cameras with way too much infrared flashlights. I need to cut it down. And I ordered some weaker infrared flashlights that will drain the battery less. And the batteries were not drained. They worked fine, but they were too bright. This shows up better uh, in darkness and so next time i'm gonna do something different but i wanted to set up this device and the other two similar devices and ask the spirit to set it off if it's inclined to want to do so i can't command it i have to ask it I have to be nice you have to wait patiently either we'll do it or it won't but the second you command and demand is the same second it can command and demand you to do something and maybe you don't want to uh, participate. If you're nice to it, it'll be nice back to you. And I say it, I don't know if it was a he or she. I did ask if he was a male or female. It didn't set the device off after I asked. But uh, I noticed it always sets off the devices left to right. Left to right. Specifically, this thing is left to right. But if I have three devices, it'll always start with the left device and then go the middle and then the end. But the tiny devices with the two prongs, this one has, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But the tiny devices have two. And the only time it doesn't go left to right is when it's the tiny device. When it's the tiny device, it goes right to left. But it still does devices left to right. Very interestingly, the same pattern over and over and over and over. Four nights, four separate months, separated by great periods, periods of time. The same spirit setting off the devices left to right. And so what I was going to do is name them A, B, C, and then mix them up. Put B, C, A, B, A, C, and it'll still set them off left to right is my theory which would prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that a programmed device is the case. This is not programmed. There's a button on here that um, sets off a noise. And so when it goes this, you'll hear Vroom! like some cartoony, dumb sound effect, which I always have it turned off. I paid extra money. I paid like extra 20 bucks to have a sound effects but I choose to have no sound effects because what if there's an EVP? What if you get a voice? And what if there's a voice coming through? And you have to listen quietly. And then, ooh, this dumb cartoon sound ruins the voice. So that's why I purposely choose to always have the dumb cartoon sound effect turned off. But left to right is a very weird, I mean, it's very interesting. It's scientific. 
almost. And the fact that it's repeatable, I would say more than almost. I would say if a scientist wants to come and bring their equipment and see the proof, I believe the spirit would set it off, but they have to show up to find out. I mean, um, it went off with Brandon Young. I was holding a camera. Brandon was holding a camera. There's a separate camera on a tripod, and there's a separate camera on a second tripod, but the other tripod camera malfunctioned, never worked. And I bought a brand new SD card, which I think is a bad card. I bought three brand new SD cards, and out of the three, one of them I think is bad. I'm going to have to return it. But luckily, three of the cameras worked perfectly fine. The fourth camera lost battery power. And I had a second battery, but Brandon said, eh, I don't want to change the batteries. It was a black and white camera. And so it was the lesser camera. The least of all the three stopped working. No big deal. You will see the footage of the grist mill, me and Brandon, in the future. Stay tuned. I still have to upload night two, night three, and night four. Raw, unedited footage to show you it's the real deal. It's proof spirits exist. Thank you for watching. This has been John Rasmus with Mysterialis Ghost Investigation. John, you really helped me understand the spirit world and the meaning of the term familiar spirits from some of your videos on the occult. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the information. Thank you for the feedback. I greatly appreciate all the help uh, that supporters of this channel give. I'm seeing a lot less views here and there. I think it has to do with across the board. Everyone is experiencing the same thing. If I push through and I will figure out to set up, Brandon will be on the next live stream. Thank you for watching. I greatly appreciate your patience. Stay tuned. Until next time, this has been John Rasmus with Mysterialis Ghost Investigation. Be seeing you.